ghosts, the unknown, the unexplainable. This is the field of expertise that me and my team seek to expose and explain. My name is Quincy Rivera. I never believed in ghosts before I was paid to on national television. I hunt these supernatural beings with my crew, Caleb Adamsonist, my trusted associate of five years, and Wyatt Receiver, a fellow History Channel alumni formerly featured on our sister program, The Harry Hunt. This is my team, and this is my ghost show. This is Tuxton, Missouri, a seemingly small town where not much happens. That is, if you ask most people. As long as anyone in Tuxton can remember, numerous sightings of forest-dwelling apparitions have haunted the small town. In order to get to the bottom of these phantoms, we meet with town historian and local eccentric, Jed McClellan. My name is uh, Jed McClellan, and uh... My family moved here about six generations ago. We've lived here ever since. Oh, well, I'm Quentin Rivera. All my friends call me Quincy. This is Caleb Adam Sinest, and this is White Receiver. Hey. Is there a fucking thing on the camp? Sorry, there's a, th there's a thing on the lens. How long have these ghostly apparitions been appearing in the, in the forest? Well, as far as I can remember, they've been in these forests since April 1877. That's the longest string of ghost sightings we've ever heard about on this show, sir. You must be proud. We are pretty proud of our history around here. So, Jed, are there any sort of historical figures that have let their spirits linger on here in Tuxton, Missouri? Well, you're actually standing in the resting place of the ghost of Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky? Guys! This could be our big break. Wayne Gretzky is huge. Is He's... Wayne Gretzky Canadian and not dead? I mean, he, he might be dead. <laughs> yeah, when's the last time you heard about Wayne Gretzky? I guess Wayne Gretzky is dead. Did Wayne Gretzky even ever like visit this town once? Did he have any family in this town? Do you have any possible reason that you would conject that his ghost would live in this town? <coughs> Jed, while, while we're here, have you ever seen any, like, big, hairy type men? God damn it, White, not right now. We don't, we don't accept those kind of people around here. I, I don't like the way you said that. Let me tell you boys something. Last group of boys came through here, I didn't like them too much. Didn't come from good stock, if you know what I'm saying. Now, I don't see color. But, uh, I like y'all a lot better. We love our history around here. Okay, can we get a different eccentric local, please? In order to get to the bottom of these apparitions, we meet with town historian and local eccentric Ken Beauregard. He's joined us outside of the Tuxton Tobacco Mill, abandoned since 1965. My name is Ken Beauregard. I'm part of the Beauregard family. Our bloodlines go back six Th that's th great just just tell us about the ghosts well our town has been visited by these specters since the late 1800s there's certainly been a lot of gossip about around town and the rumors that go on what shape do these uh do these specters take are they more are they more demonic are they humanoid these ghosts have been described pretty much the same way for centuries. They're shapeless, about the size and stature of a regular human, um, and, and they're usually accompanied by orbs. Orbs? Where do these ghosts typically appear? Well, if you follow along, I'll show you. We got a shortcut to the forest. Perfect. Wait. What? Feel that? Yeah, it is pretty humid. No, no. It's like a presence. You sure, it's not Wyatt again. Last time it was Wyatt. Ghosts. If you're here now, give me a sign. Just keep walking. Okay. 
Now, these are the Tuxton Railroad tracks. Okay. They've been said to be haunted. Reason why, here, detached voices and a strange whistle every night. Do you personally know any stories about the ghosts that supposedly haunt this area? Well, now there's a story of a, a boy named Jack Adams about 20 years ago. He used to be playing tricks on his friends. He played one game where he lay down on the tracks to see if the train would pass over him. Ooh, well, what happened? One time, he's gonna do it and the train was too close. He jumps up to get off of the tracks. Mm -hmm. He trips, hits his head, falls all the way down off the bridge. Wow. And that killed him? Oh, no. He's, he just went to the hospital. Wait, wait, is he dead? No, oh, I, I saw him just a few days ago. I asked about ghosts. Where's Caleb? 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 Ah! Caleb, no, no, get, get down, Caleb. Ghosts, if you can hear me. Push me up! No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Caleb, get down. Oh, my ghost! Well, uh, good luck with that, boys. What? Caleb, Caleb, we don't have insurance. If you fall into this construction area, they're going to make me if pay I for die. the cleanup. If I die, you have to find my ghost. I definitely wouldn't do that. There was only one way to check the validity of the words spoken by our two eccentric guides. That night, Wyatt, Caleb, and I made our way to Custer Park to hunt for proof that ghosts from the past haunt this small town even today. So this is the forest, which is supposedly haunted by ancient specters of the night. Yeah, kind of uh, spooky, isn't it? I didn't expect a children's playground to be in the way of the ghosts. Who's that? Who's that? Those are swings, Caleb. Those are, those are, those would be swings. Why do you always do this? I'm jumpy! So here we are out here in these woods. Who knows what kind of stuff we might find out here. Wyatt. Now, Wyatt, when your show got canceled and we agreed to bring you on to Ghost Show, what was the one condition we gave you? You said I couldn't look for Bigfoot. That's right. Now, we've only had to remind you of this in Maine, in Oregon, in Nevada. Y yeah, yeah, you you even look for Bigfoot in that casino in Las Vegas. What was your logic there? All right, but the question is, what, like, what if we do find him? We won't, because Bigfoot isn't real. Quincy, you cannot say that kind of shit. It's going on the fucking History Channel. All right, well, I'm just going to kind of look around. And if I do find Bigfoot or, you know, whatever, what's the harm in that? This is why your shitty show got canceled. In order to properly track any paranormal activity happening in the area, my crew set up four cameras. This will allow us to track any and all activity, essentially assuring a 24-hour surveillance system of the entire forest. Wyatt, hey buddy, you set all those cameras up? Yeah, of course I did. Okay, so what we're gonna do is me and Caleb are gonna take that ghost box thing we're gonna go into the woods, we're gonna play with that for 20 minutes, and I'm gonna try not to get a headache. Wyatt, you take that camera, and you just walk over there, and you pantomime like you're talking to ghosts. We can take that footage, we can edit that into like a 22 minute episode, and then we can leave and go to like a real place that sells good coffee. Well, good luck with that, I guess. I mean, I don't really care. My name's... Wyatt Receiver. I'm a, what you call a paranormal investigator, former 
Bigfoot hunter. I'm out here just scoping the area out for ghosts, spooks and specters, ghouls, banshees. I've been notified about two spirits out here in this area. One is uh, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, Mr. Gretzky. Can you hear me? I'm communicate. I'm reaching out to you, Wayne Gretzky. Who? Who are you? I like what? You play golf? What? What are you into, Mr. Gretzky? I'm here to send. You, I'm sending you a message about. Well, for one, what? What kind of name is that? Wayne Gretzky, Polish? I don't know too many Polish golfers. Okay. Hmm. Uh, are there any spirits with us tonight? I'm gonna try and speed it up. I definitely heard a Hurst in there. Edmund, Edmund Hurst. Brainchild? You were a prodigy? I heard prodigy. Some disgraced prodigy. He was turned into a turtle by accident? I heard the word wiener. Talk to me. Look, I'm, I'm here, I'm with you. So I thought I just, I sensed a, a an ectoplasmic uh, erupt, uh, you know, a, I can feel him right here. Wayne Greg Greg Gregsky, did you die? Why are you here? What what is what's keeping you? My ex-wife will never believe this. I'm talking to Warren Gretzky. Edmund. How did you die? You got involved in you got in Jeff the President? That, sir? Edmund, are you playing Mad Libs? They, they fed some you pizza? pizza? Another spirit I got my eye out, I got my eye on out here. A little boy, this little ghost boy, took a little tumble, hurt himself. Hit his head on some train tracks, if you can believe it. I can feel you with me here now, boy. And like, I know you're not dead, but I, I, like, I don't know all the, I don't know everything there is to know about ghosts. Maybe you're a ghost from the future. Maybe you're a ghost from the past. But I just wanted, I want to communicate to you here now across this void of darkness, right? So are you, you like trains, right? Do you like trains? I'm trying to, I'm trying to communicate with you. You like, boy. I mean, Edmund, we're talking in circles here, man. You gotta give us something. Did you hear your name? Yeah, I heard my name. Well, that's a breakthrough. He knows you. Come do you on. Know I, do you know what I hate about this thing? No, it, we were getting somewhere. He knows you. He's no, talking to you. Do you know what I hate about this thing? What do you hate? Uh, what? It's built to give us evidence. What do you mean? Well, don't you see that's an inherently flawed system to build a machine? No. You, we're, we're reaching out into the ether. Caleb, this isn't designed to, to give us authentic evidence. Well, yes, it's it designed, is. No, it's designed to give us any evidence. Don't you see the problem with that? Yes, and evidence is good. This would be like if I built a machine where, where you put in a picture of someone and it uh -huh. says they're a killer. Yeah. No, no, it always, found says, the... it always says they're a killer. Because they're killers. No, no, because it would always, it would always flash green. It, what, I, does it flash green or does it tell them, like, how, how this... Green, how it, there's a green right light and a red light. Green light means they're a murderer. Okay, then, that, that means no they're a murderer. Bulb. There's no red bulb. It only flashes green. I, well, I think you should have the red bulb when they're not, but they're murderers. No, 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 it always goes green. So uh, it yes, says, because you're catching murderers. No, 
No, no, no. I'm saying it thinks it, it always, no matter what you do, it'll always say they're a murderer. Because they murder people. I, I really don't think. You I think it's a great idea. I think that. I think that that it could be. It wasn't a real pitch. It's not a real machine. That's how we could supplement the show, though. You build that. We could have a sister show, right? Like Where instead I put of like pictures of people murder and show, and it says they're murderers murderer show. Every time. We go from ghost show to murderer show. I just want to free these two spirits. This this racquetball player, this star athlete, and this little boy. I want to help that boy, and I want to help you too, Wayne. Uh, we got to put we this boy's this little boy's pain. This ghost boy, even though he's not dead, I mean, I just want to help. I just want to help you, but you need, you need to talk to me, Wayne, Wayne Gretty. I need you to help me help you. I've got the ghost boy. Boy hit his head. Now, I don't know if that means anything to you, but it means a heck of a lot to me. Just one more time, I'm feeling it. We were getting somewhere with Edmund. It's for me, all right? Look, I know, it's not, I know it's late, but I'm feeling something with this case. Look. All right, we can do it again. Come on. Are there any ghosts with us today? Come on. Okay, it's never done it's, that before. It's, it's speeding up. It's speeding up. We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere, ladies hey. and gentlemen. Hey, it's never, it's going crazy. We're getting somewhere. Come on, keep okay. going. Keep going. Um, hey, keep going. Uh, Ed. Oh my. We're gonna do it. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to 88.1 WRFL, the only alternative station left on the dial. That was Eat Your Mother Alive by Bad Habit. And before that, we had Amazing Grace played by the Bagpipes. That was actually a number one hit in the UK. It's been a rough night, but as long as we can get back to the hotel, yeah. I think we'll be fine. And we can get some coffee and think about this whole thing. Yeah. Hey, we'll be fine. Yeah. We'll be fine. Here I am back out front of, out in front of these woods and I don't see anyone else around. Just me and the you ghosts. Maybe I'll try a little What the fuck? I'm gonna kill him. Hey, buddy. What you up to? Ghost mating call? Ghost mating call. Wyatt, I told you to stop looking for Bigfoot. Okay, but we're out here in the woods. Where does Big Bigfoot lives in the woods? Bigfoot lives in the woods. So you think. Wyatt, Bigfoot is not living in some park in Bumfuck, Missouri. Okay, but what if he is? What if he is? I am going to turn you into one of the ghosts that we find on this show. We haven't found any ghosts on this no, show. We haven't found Bigfoot either yet. Here we are. Who the fuck is this guy? What was that? You guys hear that? No way. What is that? Bigfoot. Shut up, Shut Wyatt. Shut the fuck up, No Wyatt. one cares. Shut the fuck up, Wyatt. Follow it. Fuck. It's on the move. We gotta go. Go, go, go. Go!
Oh my gosh. Ghosts. Actual ghosts. There they are. We've been doing this for years, and I never once, not a single day, and I think we'd actually find ghosts. Me neither, dude. Me neither. We came out here looking for ghosts, but what we really found was friendship. I love you guys. Those were Klansmen. Yeah. Distinctly Klansmen. But I think it was kind of our fault. I mean, we really should have vetted all this better. To our credit, we set out to solve the mystery of the specters in the park. And I think that we accomplished that goal. What are you doing? You okay? You will... Are you okay? Is this... I... Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. Please put your shoes on. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It's all right. Listen, buddy, we get it. It's look. You're fine. We're fine. See, there you go. Put your shoes on. I need some time alone. All right. I'll I'll be back. Okay. All right. Have you ever noticed? That Quinn's feet are really big. Huge. Shut the fuck up, Wyatt! Whose orders are those, then? Colonel Stark, sir. Colonel Stark?! And who's that, then? Commanding Officer, Operation Fallen Angel, Groom Lake Army Air Base. What? You mean Area 51? Dreamland? This is Dreamland. It's an episode of Doctor Who from 2009, which typically isn't included in the regular numbering of the show, so most people tend to skip it if entirely by accident. It's become one of the most obscure episodes not only because of that, but additionally because the animation has aged so badly that it is almost entirely unwatchable. I'm the Doctor, by the way. I'm Cassie. This is Jimmy Stalking Wolf. Ooh. But the reason that I have generously selected it for previewing today is that it also happens to be one of the least creative, most culturally generic takes on what Area 51 is behind closed doors. Now that is an alien. Franchises like Doctor Who, Star Trek, and Star Wars have worldwide fan bases, captivating billions every single day. And the base connection between all of them is that they all seek to answer an eternal question which has haunted humanity for centuries. That being... Are we alone? Is there life on other planets, or is humanity a fluke 
Did evolution, even in its most basic form, happen because of a set of standards that have existed literally nowhere else? Or is Earth as special as a grain of sand on the beach? Science has answers of sorts. That it's statistically improbable that we are the only life in the universe, and that even other planets in our solar system might have at one point hosted some sort of simple bacteria. In fact, one could go as far as to say that statistically, there almost certainly has to be complex life somewhere out there in the cosmos, a civilization so advanced that its people look into the stars at night and wonder if they're alone. They want to know if we exist, just as much as we want to know if they exist. But despite this mutual yearning, our two civilizations will almost certainly never touch fingers, and for one simple, upsetting reason. Space travel sucks. It is impossible to move faster than the speed of light. In fact, it's improbable to get even close. So if there's a planet that hosts intelligent life that is 10,000 light years away, it would take them 15,000 years to get here. And that's a frustrating thought, that it would be just as easy for aliens to come to us as for us to go to the aliens. So we tend to try and not give thoughts like that too much weight, and instead we distract ourselves with society-wide delusions. It's all right. I'm the doctor. I want to go home. In this video, we're going to talk about Area 51. I'm going to tell you what it is, why I know what it is, and why it's important. But then, we're going to talk about what people thought Area 51 was before they found out the truth which I actually think is a little bit more interesting. Mainly because there are real conspiracies behind Area 51. Lies that were put into place like dominoes by figures who came to profit from them. And the story that we all believed for decades and decades was exactly the story that the US government wanted us to believe all along. After the end of World War II, a new conflict quickly approached around the horizon, one which is today looked back on as a bout of extreme paranoia caused by the cultivation of two extremely territorial superpowers, the United States of America and the USSR. Two countries who very openly did not like one another. Two years after the war came to an end, President Truman signed into effect a doctrine which stated that the United States would guarantee economic and military aid towards any state opposing Soviet expansion, kickstarting the pseudo-conflict known as the Cold War. This act created an iron curtain between the different civilizations, where each side developed and evolved separately with no contact between them, as each essentially viewed the other as a potential adversary in a Third World War. Truman became increasingly paranoid of the advancements and tactics of the Soviets at the time, and created in 1946 the Central Intelligence Group, which had a short run before being replaced by the Central Intelligence Agency, which had two main purposes. To monitor Russian activities for the sake of providing intel for the various other branches, and to have a cooler sounding acronym than CIG. But providing said intel could be a significant problem, as the United States quickly found out that their understanding of even the geography of Russia was extremely outdated. By sneaking through defenses during top secret missions, America attempted to have new images captured, but those pilots were often shot down, the missions left in limbo and officially never taking place. America didn't want to admit that they had sanctioned these secret missions, and Russia didn't want to admit that the missions had actually gotten past their defenses. This inspired what has become known as one of the most top secret operations since the Manhattan Project. Known under a vast array of code names, my favorite being Project Dragon Lady, the goal of the CIA was fairly simple. They would build a plane with no guns, no bombs, and only a simple camera attached, which would fly high enough to avoid detection and to capture the enemy land on film. The CIA intended to make the operation as unconnected to the military as humanly possible. This was mostly done for one simple reason. If military pilots flew over Russia, it would be an act of war. 
And that was something that the United States probably needed to avoid at this point. So it was decided that any pilot involved in these missions would have to be non-military, meaning that many of the most suitable candidates had to resign from their posts in order to take the job. By 1955, the project was faring well, and the nearly completed U-2 planes were close to being ready for test flights. But the CIA still lacked a secure base to attempt these. And so, that April, several visits were made to potential areas by selected operatives. One key area visited was a section of the Nevada test site which had been used to test America's nuclear arsenal. The land was divided into a random grid formation. On the 51st area of said grid sat Groom Lake, which was soon found to be a near-perfect place to build the base. It was extremely dry and had weather good enough to test flights, and it had a low population nearby who would be very unlikely to see these taking place. The only true drawback of Area 51 was that it was downwind of severe radioactive fallback. But, eh, who cares? Certainly not the cast of The Conqueror, the John Wayne film that's so bad that it literally gave everyone cancer. Construction of the base started soon after this. Despite what pop culture will tell you, the government did not deny that the base existed, but rather they told the public that it was being created by NASA in order to research weather patterns. It was given the official name the Watertown Strip, which I quite like because it makes it sound like a theme park. Not a good theme park, a really crummy theme park. <laughs> and with typical theme park fashion, the CIA built the base with a construction company which they made up for the operation. Cast members were forced to turn in IDs upon arrival at the base and were given new identities that they would share among the people they met. Inside, they were told that they were working on utility aircrafts, similar to the pre-existing U-1 and U-3 planes, which the U-2 was obviously named to match. The U-2 aircraft proved to be very difficult for some pilots to handle, characterized by loving to fly and hating to land. During the first test, the plane bounced severely upon landing, and the brakes not only didn't work, but they caught on fire. The brakes caught on fire. To pilot the U-2, you had to pass through severe standards, both physically and in your background. The pilots were forced to wear suits not unlike those of astronauts due to the incredible shift in altitude. And even then, their bodies were put under significant stress. And during one eight-hour flight, pilots were known to lose several pounds at a time. Potential contenders had to show particular patronage to the United States as to avoid the threat of Soviet defection. And they couldn't be gay. I don't have a big explanation for that last one, it's just something that's true. Area 51 is not LGBT+. Now, a big thing you have to realize about Area 51 is that it wasn't really built to be permanent. For one, the base was pretty close to ongoing test sites and was known to get trashed pretty constantly. But more importantly, the U-2 was expected to have a very short lifespan in terms of its practicality. The United States designed the plane to fly too high for the USSR to detect or shoot down, as far as they knew. But they were also fully aware that the Soviets would eventually develop to the point that they could detect and then shoot down these specific planes. And this is exactly what happened. In 1957, the first clandestine U-2 operations took place, and in 1960, the USSR officially shot one of these planes down. The CIA freaked. Now, their best information indicated that if one of these planes were to be shot down, the pilot would not have survived. So, as far as they knew, Russia had a crashed plane and a dead body. So, they started preparing misinformation to soften the blow of Russia coming out with this story. This is my favorite part of the research I did. It's so stupid and so funny. So, they took a U-2 spy plane and they painted a NASA logo on it. And then they just sort of drove it from their top secret military base to a NASA base. And they did a bunch of like press things where they were like, this is our weather plane. And it was near Russian airspace and it, and it went missing. It must have flown off course. And, and we don't know where this pilot is. But what they didn't realize was miraculously, the pilot in the U-2 plane he had survived being shot down, and when he was questioned by the Russians, he, like, told them about the entire operation, enough that he wasn't threatening American security, 
but the Russians still thought he was, like, being complacent with their questioning. The, the point is that the Russians at this point totally knew about the operation, and they were just, like, patiently waiting for the CIA to make an ass out of the entire country. And then they made the entire operation very open for the world, causing a lot of hubbub at various world leader events that took place after this. The funny thing is that the U-2 has actually turned out to be one of the most long-lasting aircrafts in aviation history, still being used in operations to this day. And similarly, the Area 51 base is still staffed and used for operations, although it's now manned by the Air Force and not the CIA. It's often been used to test enemy technology that has been captured, including Soviet planes and other sorts of stuff in the 1960s. This information would be forwarded through to aviation training courses, which would help military personnel train for actual combat. Now, most of the information we've talked about today at the time was very top secret and classified. No one was allowed to know about it, but that changed after the Freedom of Information Pass Act, and in the past couple decades since then, slowly it's all come out, and finally we got the last big piece of the puzzle in uh, 2013 when we finally got told by the CIA, hey, this is what Area 51 is. It's kind of obvious in hindsight. I did a lot of extensive research while doing this video, and I ended up finding it all like super interesting, but not very shocking. In, in terms of like evil stuff the CIA did during the Cold War or has ever done, this doesn't even hit like the top 30. <laughs> the most interesting thing to me about this story is that in this massive culture, which was built around being like, hey, the government's lying to us and I know the truth, not one person actually seemed to say the truth. The only thing they got right was that there was a conspiracy. Almost as if all these conspiracy theories are a protective layer that helps the government lie instead of stopping them from doing so. The evolution of UFO culture is one which is somewhat fascinating to me. While it originated partially from the Roswell hoax, it quickly spread throughout the country. I think its relation to Cold War anxiety shouldn't be ignored. People were probably afraid of UFOs coming from the skies, partially because they were equally worried about the Russians sending missiles and planes to kickstart the end of the world. But it wasn't really until the 1970s that all this really started to take off. And one story in particular is very relevant, in my opinion, to the evolution of the beliefs within this community. Paul Benowitz was an engineer who had built up a history of working with various United States organizations during the end of the 1970s. He additionally lived in a house which gave him a beautiful view of Kirkland Air Force Base pretty much at all times of day. In 1979, he began to see strange lights in the sky and transmissions that seemed to go with them, and he started recording both under the belief that it was important for national security. He soon went to the Air Force to give them this information as a warning, and the Air Force freaked out, because what he had actually been documenting was top-secret test flights of classified aircraft. It was then that Paul informed them that he believed these lights to be extraterrestrial alien UFOs. To which the Air Force responded, Yep. But one person in the agency decided that he wanted to take all this a little bit further, and almost undeniably a little bit too far. He began regularly meeting with Benowitz and started feeding him classified documents and top secret information. But the catch was that none of it was real. It was all fake stuff that he was just making up on the fly. These would say things like that the US government had UFOs, or that they were working with aliens who were sort of evil, or that they had secret underground bases. And again, it was like all lies, it was just stuff this guy was making up to protect the Air Force. Now this accomplished two main things. For one, it pushed Benowitz in totally the wrong direction in terms of his investigations, and for two, it meant that when he went public with this information, the things that were obviously not true were mixed in with the things that were secretly real, meaning that no one believed anything that he said. Essentially, the United States Air Force was gaslighting this dude. And by the time Doty realized he had gone too far and tried to expose the real truth underneath the truth that he had told him was the truth, Benowitz had sort of lost his mind, and the rest of his life is pretty sad. 
And the thing is that Benowitz ended up being a somewhat popular figure in the UFO community both before and after the secret operations were revealed. Which means that a lot of popular beliefs that UFOologists currently see to be true are at the very least influenced by this government misinformation campaign. And that includes the popular cultural idea of what Area 51 really is. And isn't that just sort of heavily ironic in an undeniable way? Men who have based like their entire lives around believing that they know the secret truth behind conspiracies conducted by the American government are actually the victims of a real documented government conspiracy. I'm not sure if you guys have pieced together this conclusion yet, but in case you haven't, I'm so excited to say this sentence out loud because it's such a mind blower. <clears throat> UFOs are real. They've been real for decades, because all a UFO is, is an unidentified flying object. And recent studies have revealed that sightings of unidentified flying objects skyrocketed the moment that the government started testing planes that they didn't want anyone to know about. In fact, a recently declassified CIA study from 1998 indicates that out of all of the investigation work that they did into UFO sightings in the 1950s, at least half of them could be attributed to the YouTube program. And that's just so fascinating to me, because that is the apex of, like, UFO culture and aesthetics. It's UFO sightings in the 1950s, you know? And more than half of those can be openly attributed to the government having secret stuff and just not telling anyone about it. In some weird way, people creating this culture where aliens are associated with UFOs have really done nothing other than actively delegitimize evidence of the government's wrongdoing. But when I chose to title this video, The Lies Behind Area 51, and I put like an alien in the thumbnail so you guys would know that I was going to talk about who was lying about these aliens. I wasn't making reference to the CIA or the US government. Sure, those people have lied, and those lies being out there certainly have helped in developing this community, but I think there's another group of people who deserve to be shouted out for specifically telling misinformation for their own personal gain. While I was researching this video, I ended up reading this book, which is called UFOs, The Public Deceived, and is written by a man named Philip J. Class. Now, Class was well known at the time for being one of the first and only UFO skeptics, using his knowledge of aviation, the human mind, and hoaxes to basically try and understand the entire culture and how misinformation is spread in it. This was written in 1987, which means it's a little tedious and outdated just because it's discussing the most popular UFO cases of the time, which most of you probably haven't even heard of today. But it's still really interesting to read him just debunk a lot of these in really simple ways. All of these cases have very simple explanations. Either there was another, like, launch at the same time that could have been mistaken for a UFO, or there was, like, a flight that had certain wings where you couldn't see the wings, so people mistook it for, like, a cigar-shaped thing. And, and a bunch of stuff like that, just very basic things. Also, he talks about how a lot of these cases were done by active hoaxers, because, like, scam artists got very into UFO culture because, because of how gullible people were about these things. And all this information was totally out there at the time. It was absolutely readily available. And yet, every respectable journalist at the time chose to ignore all of these things. And for one very simple reason. That Philip J. Class's hot takes about UFO culture didn't make a lot of money. I mean, it's no wonder that I had to find a very old copy of this book, because even to, like, publishers who own the rights, why publish one book that tells you the truth when you can publish 40 books that tell blatant lies? Documentary crews, respectable journalists, TV shows, they would all either refuse to interview the skeptics who knew things that were true, or they would do the interviews, get the information, and then use as little of it as possible. And they would show these hoaxes in the productions, which they knew were hoaxes because they had interviewed the guy who exposed them, 
and they would just put it in anyways for some unseen reason. I mean, a classic example of this is Unsolved Mysteries, a show which I really want to analyze sometime, because that show is 50% respectable journalism that helped the country, and 50% utter drivel that is worth absolutely nothing to anyone. These people who were pretending to tell the forbidden truth knew that they were lying and they didn't care because lying made them more money. And you see this continue today with channels like History Channel and Discovery. These people know they're saying things that aren't true, but they don't care because they just really need to get paid. And furthermore, I believe that a lot of these cases ended up being pushed further and further because many of these small towns, which were originally never heard of, have their economies become dependent on people believing in these things. And so people on the towns are sort of incited to, eh, you know, exaggerate a little, uh, sell this story. I mean, near Roswell and Area 51, there are these towns which are built entirely around being tourist traps for UFOologists and, like, curious tourists. And those wouldn't be there, or at the very least they wouldn't be very popular, if those things were associated with what they really are. Roswell with bad reporting, and Area 51 with the testing of U-2 spy planes. Like, who cares? Aliens sell, so they sell alien stuff. You have been sold lies about aliens and UFOs and Area 51 your entire life. And partially by the government. Let's be fair, government sucks. But also just by journalists and small-town tourism boards that become dependent on cultures that are built around people buying their stupid crap. And by a sort of socio-economic inertia that makes it really hard for any of this to be turned back. And in response to that incredible revelation, all I can really muster is... Welcome to America! Anyways, in case I've been wrong throughout this entire video, here's a list of things that could be stored in Area 51. A fully animated edit of the Chris Farley version of Shrek. The rest of the Lost Normnet comics by Jim Davis. The frozen remains of all of Walt Disney except for his head. Another, smaller Area 51. A second season of the obscure Eric Idle ghost sitcom Nearly Departed. Half-Life 4, The Search for Half-Life 3. Dozens of missing episodes of Doctor Who, but only the really embarrassing ones. A volleyball court and a movie theater for people on the base who got bored. That one's actually real, it was in the book I read. Every sock you've ever lost in the laundry. A live-action Robotech movie not stuck in production hell. An hour-long review of To Boldly Flee. And finally... Right here I revealed the ad, I'm not, I'm not doing ads in this edit. In 2012, a documentary was released titled The Imposter to Critical and Commercial Acclaim. The story follows the life of French con artist Frédéric Bourdin. In 1997, Frédéric managed to convince American officials that he was actually Nicholas Barclay, a 13-year-old from Texas who had gone missing three years earlier. Bourdin and Barclay had little in common. Bourdin's eyes were not the right color, and he had a noticeable French accent, implying that he had been in the country for more than three years. Despite this, he was able to convince the family of the missing child that he was, in fact, their little boy. He was shipped to America and lived as 17-year-old Nicholas Barclay for the next five months, before his coup was discovered by local officials. In the documentary, heavy scrutiny is put on the family for this. How, it is wondered, could they blindly accept that this 24-year-old Frenchman was their missing teenage son, when all evidence suggested otherwise. Why would they give him plentiful information about their family tree, which he then used to trick American officials into believing his story? Was it possible they knew all along that this couldn't be their son, and that they had ulterior motives in helping support his story? Throughout the story, Frederick recalls feeling scared of the family as he realized that there was something afoot that they just weren't telling him. It was possible, he realized, that the disappearance of Nicholas Barclay was caused by one of the members of the family, 
and that they knowingly fed into his fib in order to give themselves an alibi. As if they wanted police to believe that their son was still alive so his disappearance would not be properly looked into. Extensive doubt is then put into the lives and stories of every member of the Barclay family, and great speculation is made over which one of them was most likely to commit murder. And then, in the final moments of the film, a small detail is lightly dropped in our laps. Frederick Bourdieu is a pathological liar. He's a man who not only impersonated a missing child, but then went back to France and did it a second time, and then a third time, and then a fourth time. Alongside this, he would constantly attempt to provide fake leads about other missing children to other grieving families. Even while sitting in prison for previous attempts at this, and all of this because he craved attention. When this is revealed literally moments before the credits roll, you end up feeling mad about how this documentary has presented all of this. Why have the filmmakers left out this crucial detail and tricked us into believing that this random grieving family with a missing 13 year old son were actually the bad guys in this story of this horrible, horrible monster? I think about this a lot. And the answer I've come to is that the imposter shouldn't be looked at as a commentary on cold cases or tragedies or anything like that that you might otherwise expect, but instead as a piece that asks you to question the very format you have been buying into during its extensive runtime. The modern documentary style of choosing a voice, a key person in the story, and latching onto their perspective obsessively as the one worth telling, even if it happens to be the most empirically untrustable one in a story. Stop. Rewind. I want to talk about unsolved mysteries. I've wanted to talk about this show for a very long time, and that's the case for a lot of reasons. Unsolved Mysteries influence the future of television and general informational media in a way that's almost impossible to measure. Pretty much any true crime documentary show that you can watch today, Forensic Files, The First 48, Sex and Murder, Forensic Files 2, Forensic Files 3D, they all have unsolved mysteries to thank for the basic genealogy of their content. Now, there are two ways to look at unsolved mysteries, both equally valid but slightly mutually exclusive. Here's take one. Unsolved Mysteries was an attempt by NBC to use the massive power and influence of television to solve crimes and cold cases around the country. This was back when the world was generally unconnected, and it was pretty easy to commit a crime in an obscure place and then simply slip off and start a new identity without anyone raising an eye. Unsolved Mysteries thus took these cases and elevated them to worldwide recognition. Tuning in for the show became a common occurrence for people of all ages, as audiences became obsessed with the idea that they could help solve a mystery. And in enough cases for it to be impressive, the show's broadcasts did lead to the identification and arrest of dangerous people all across America. Unsolved Mysteries was a project made by investigators with the goal of bringing people together and accomplishing great things. Fugitives were brought to justice, families were reunited constantly time and time again. The show overwhelmingly had a positive influence on the world and the stories it covered. Okay, so uh, here's take two about the show. Unsolved Mysteries was middle-class fear-bathing designed to boost ratings. The coverage given to any specific segment was not bound by if the story was good journalism or if it was even true, but instead by how flashy it could seem when presented within the given format. Here's a theoretical question for you. Let's say you're a director, and you arrive at a location of a supposed story for the show. However, when you look into it, you quickly deduce that everything you've been told up to this point is bunk. 
Either the story is a massive hoax, or it's been overwhelmingly solved ages ago and people just don't find the answer satisfying. Well, if that's the case, you're shit out of luck. Because you work for a show called Unsolved Mysteries. You have an ultimate duty to present the story in a way that makes it seem like there is something of interest in the case. And the way that the show ultimately accomplishes this is by structuring itself off of testimony and then choosing to never question what is said and presumably to leave any contradictions on the editing room floor. Stories this show would report on were often so outlandish and improbable that even Robert Stack was known to jokingly roast the crew for the material that they handed over to him. Hi, excuse me. Oh, hi. How many of these chocolates have you eaten already? Oh, I had a whole bunch. Why? Really? A whole bunch. Um, because those are Dr. Watson's love potions. Love potions? What's that? Charlie was already halfway to paradise and probably could have left Dr. Watson's love drops on the mantel. But Charlie wasn't taking any chances. Oh, chocolate hearts. In between honest investigations and criminal mysteries, the show would insert stories with hauntings, the paranormal, UFOs, and of course, these could be the most hilarious and impossible to believe, but they would keep people watching. But even many of the other stories, which are considered to be more reputable, turn out to be heavily filled with misinformation when you actually look into them. It's amazing how many episodes of the show come to conclusions with such confidence, and yet those conclusions have been made by essentially no other reputable person ever. Did you know that Amelia Earhart was captured by the Japanese and executed? She definitely wasn't, but it's a fun thing to believe in. Robert Stack once described making the show as a compromise between making theater and doing a public service. And theater just happened to be more important in most cases. And this helps hammer home the first lesson we have to understand. Most documentaries are entertainment, not journalism. The reason this can become a problem is that there isn't exactly an industry standard for documentaries to cite their sources. And yet, they are traditionally treated as primary text by most people and viewers are encouraged to not look into those topics on their own. Researching most of the cases which Unsolved once covered is close to impossible today, because everyone tends to just parrot the narrator's claims word for word, when it's entirely possible that some of those facts were exaggerated or made up on the spot. You know, a great example of this problem in action is the documentary Supersize Me. If you took a health class in the early 2010s like I did, you probably got forced to watch this thing at some point. Teachers loved it, and it's easy to understand why. The film was a disturbing and shocking voyage into how mistreating your own body can lead to terrifying results. As Morgan Spurlock forces himself to eat nothing but McDonald's every day for 30 days. But in the decade and a half since Super Size Me was released, it has become one of the most consistently doubted documentaries of all time, as almost every attempt to recreate its results have failed. In fact, many people who have imitated his stunt have actually lost significant weight. To put it briefly, it seems that Spurlock was purposefully overeating at the restaurant and trying to avoid exercise to make his results seem more sensational, as it's insisted in the documentary that he is eating more than 5,000 calories a day. The counter-documentary Fathead mocks this and points out how impossible it is to get anywhere near that with even the biggest three meal packages without breaking every rule in Spurlock's book. And it's funny to think about how meaningless that makes this documentary under this context. If you go to McDonald's and purposefully eat 5,000 calories worth of burgers every day, your health will decline. Whoa, no way, man, this is crazy. Our second lesson here is that most filmmakers have a gluttonous desire for people to watch their movies. The reason I've been thinking about all of this is because of the release of the recent Netflix hit, Tiger King. Let's be real here. Tiger King is much like the real Joe Exotic. It's an extremely watchable film series and a great guilty pleasure. Truly, it's one of the most entertaining things to come out amid this quarantine. But as someone who loves documentaries and loves the good that a documentary can do, 
I'm not sure I would ever say that it's a good documentary piece. Tiger King starts off as a lot of fun. You're seeing these crazy people doing all these cartoonish, backwater eccentric things. Personally, they all ended up reminding me of a lot of people I went to school with, but didn't really know that well. And it's easy to see why people have latched on to Joe as the source of memes and deprecations. And when you meet his lifelong enemy, Carol Baskin, it's also obvious why so many people would decide that they hated her with a fiery passion. But as it goes on, this becomes a lot less funny, as you realize that these figureheads are all horrible, manipulative monsters, and that many of the people presented in the documentary suffer from mental illness and disease. The show is basically structured around presenting you a narrative, then adding doubt to that while selling another story, then repeating that process over and over again, forever. It depends largely on personal testimony from people involved, and chooses not to tell you certain details in order to warp your perspective of the situation. Numerous times over the course of the documentary, it seems like someone is not telling the truth or is stretching what really happened, but there isn't really any follow-up or response. It's like the filmmakers think it's just good TV to let people lie on their platform without being challenged in any significant way. Some of the biggest revelations that's come out since the story is just how much material wasn't put into the film for one reason or another. For instance, the directors have admitted to leaving out many overtly racist moments surrounding Joe in the movie, specifically his use of slurs and various rants he went on. And the reason this had to be done, in my opinion, is that the film only really works if you start it with the slightest belief that Joe might be some sort of redneck anti-hero. It's possible to make a guy who tried to kill a woman seem approachable, but not if he's a bigot. Also left out is a lot of the character's extensive history with animal abuse, dating back all the way to 1999, when he was caught shooting a group of malnourished emu that he had offered to give sanctuary. Additional stories, like him shooting horses for pleasure, also seems to hit the cutting room floor. It seems that the abuse of animals that happened at the zoo was constant and continuous and worse than what we saw on screen, but presenting that information at the gate would make people not want to watch him be a jackass for the full runtime. Joe's testimony is often presented without question and is treated as valid by default in an attempt to appeal to both sides of the conversation. What this means is that lies are placed into the documentary and then not questioned leading the audience to sometimes believe them flat out by default. At the end, when Joe says that he shot and killed those five tigers because they were all sick and needed to be euthanized, you're tempted to believe him. And it's not until you watch the After Party episode that you learn that he definitely killed the tigers because he didn't have enough space. Literally just watching people from the story talk in an unedited fashion tells you more of the truth than watching the entire series. You know, it's fascinating to me that Carol Baskin has been branded the enemy of the internet. I think the main reason is that Carol is the kind of bad person that we all know and can understand. She's the know-it-all, better-than-you, PETA-obsessed wine mom who probably voted for Biden. But she's also the first person the film ultimately chooses to go after eventually leading to a surreal moment where it seems like the directors are playfully acting as if vigilantism against her would actually be a good thing. Because you're afraid of Carol Baskin. Oh yes, I am. I'm taking Carol on because everyone else is scared too. And it's crazy to read upon the real facts later and to realize that so much of what is presented in the episodes designed to bash her is either misinformation or lies. For instance, it's claimed that Don was a multimillionaire when Carol met him. This isn't true, because he only gained his wealth when he and Carol started buying and selling real estate. Don's ex-wife claims that the moment Don met Carol, he said he was leaving her, causing emotional disruption. But apparently, everyone in his life knew that he constantly cheated all the time, and Don's ex-wife only sought out divorce when she met another man, asking for only $1 million in exchange for keeping the process short. She later sued him for more, and the couple's kids took the stand against Don, and in exchange he never spoke to any of them again. 
Another woman in the documentary also embezzled $60,000 from Don's company, and everyone else has similar issues, which makes them really untrustable sources. The documentary lightly glosses over the fact that Don had lost his pilot's license and had been flying illegally for years and was terrible at it. It's also casually left out that Don was supposedly loaning money to the Costa Rica Mafia, which is a pretty crucial piece of information. I don't know, just my perspective. I think Carol had motive to kill her husband, but I think she lacked means or opportunity. It's really hard to believe she somehow got rid of the body in a way that no person has found evidence of in 10 years. It's also fucking hilarious when the documentary describes to us how she had like a kitchen meat grinder that was very small, but instead the editors throw in like a fucking Sweeney Todd ass thing, like completely lying to the audience in our faces and expecting us to just not notice. The point is that all of the things leveled against Carol are circumstantial. And meanwhile, all of these other larger-than-life personalities come across as definite criminals and manipulative monsters. When you realize that so many of these private tiger collections are actually weird, surreal, hierarchical sex cults who legitimately try to brainwash young women into trading sex for higher staff positions, it feels weird to go back and remember that those same people were attacking Carol for running a nonprofit and having volunteers show up. I mean, why does this documentary spend a dedicated time trying to make a spectacle out of all of these details when so much of the more serious stuff is presented with barely any thesis? Animal abuse aside, it's disgusting the way that Joe treated people at his zoo, underpaying them and giving them homes without working water and specifically going after people with no chance to leave or to get a better life. But these moments are usually presented as buffoonish or inspiring, with the editing randomly choosing what narrative to tell based on the person talking. That strange roller coaster is the exact thing that Tiger King banks itself on. You end up leaving without really feeling like there was any thesis statement about animal abuse or mental health or anything like that. Instead, it's just trying to capture and recreate this feud between these two ego-filled people and everyone around them as carnival performers putting on a show. It's sort of annoying to think that most of these people's lives were driven this way because of poverty, because of drugs, and that their lives aren't going to fundamentally change once this all passes, while these documentary creators will gain fame and fortune for this project. But hey, it's an entertaining story, and maybe that's just what America needs right now. I don't want people walking away from this thinking that I think that all documentaries are bad. Actually, documentaries are my favorite kind of media. If done right, they can really leave an impact and inform you about the truth behind a situation. I think my favorite three documentaries are Killer Legends, Three Identical Strangers, and Prosecuting Evil. Killer Legends is an investigation into American myth, and when those myths can actually be rooted in an unseen truth. Prosecuting Evil is about one of the leading men behind the Nuremberg Trials and his ongoing fight to punish crimes against humanity. And Three Identical Strangers is about something so insane that I think you should just watch it with no context whatsoever. I'd really like it if you guys gave me some documentary recommendations in the comments section below because they're my favorite kind of media but it can be hard to find the good ones, you know? The point I'm trying to make is that it's important when viewing these projects to understand that in the modern age, documentaries have mainly evolved into being art. And art is fiction. But do you know what's never delivered with complicated motivations? YouTube sponsorships! Hush, my darling, be still, my darling, the lion's on the phone. On January the 1st, 1995, the History Channel was officially launched as a basic cable station included in packages across the country. It premiered the exact same month as the Gulf Channel, which seems like an odd thing to point out, if not for the fact that it signified a trend in channels with oddly specific programming. 
while the Golf Channel played golf footage every hour of the day and every day of the week. The History Channel would explore the world's past through a series of television shows and specials. For some time, the History Channel was regarded as a brilliant educational exercise which proved that entertainment with value was possible in modern America. Today, however, the History Channel is seen either as a total oddity or a punchline. So far declined from its initial healthy goals that you would think it was a metaphor for my diet during the quarantine. Meanwhile, the Golf Channel still seems to play nothing but golf to this very day. What happened to history? This was a question I briefly considered covering in my last video before I realized that it was such a hefty topic that it really deserved to be split off and analyzed on its own. And so today, we're going to be taking a look back at the programming of this station as we talk about the good, the bad, and the generally stupid. Seeking out the earliest History Channel programming was a really interesting task. It was neat seeing how these different shows stuck to the basic theme while being totally unique and beyond just having different shows dedicated to different time periods. Inspector Gadget's Field Trip was a 1996 show which featured the character Inspector Gadget exploring different parts of the world. The gimmick being a mix of traditional animation with live-action footage of real locations, similar to the 2004 PBS show Postcards from Buster. History's Lost and Found, meanwhile, would go through various historical items of the past, ones which were once lost, and others which can still be found today. American Eats featured discussions on the history of America's favorite foods. From Spam to Canned Ravioli, Ancients Behaving Badly was a sensational look at figures in history known for horrible deeds. Forensic Fight Club is a show we won't talk about, and in my personal favorite example, Extreme Trains was about a guy who's really into trains getting paid to ride them all day and just showing off his boyish excitement about the fact that his life consists of doing this all the time. Right here. What it boils down to, it's just like a giant teapot. However, out of all of these, Modern Marvels probably stands out the most. The show is an exploration into the technology available in the modern age, very similar to how it's made, but with more emphasis being put on the history of these achievements. Episodes span vastly, from the Eiffel Tower to Kentucky Bourbon, each providing a fascinating story and a lot of truth to be discovered. But it should be pointed out that just because something was on History Channel during its golden era doesn't mean that it's actually what I would call good documentary storytelling. And that's usually because they rarely chose to cover more than a surface level look at the past. Remember when your middle school history teacher would come into class hungover, so she'd put on a documentary she found at the school library and just sort of sit in the dark for a while? That's what these are for. It's textbook storytelling intended to invest you into the past without telling you the bits that make the story uncomfortable. It's Hamilton, the cable channel. It was really annoying when I found a documentary that talked about Andrew Jackson, who is, if you didn't know, one of the worst people in all of history, only to discover that they so quickly glossed over some of the greatest atrocities of his term as if they were simply footnotes to his legacy. It's baffling that someone could literally commit an act of genocide only to have a reflective documentary spend 15 seconds discussing this before spending 20 minutes talking about juicy juicy 19th century drama. He was the type of man, it was a complex individual to say the least, as all great individuals are. This is a personal thing that bothers me that might not bother you, but I think that if you're going to make informative media about the past, you shouldn't purposefully underreport the actions and beliefs of these figures just to make them more likable. If you make a documentary about Thomas Jefferson and you don't talk about the fact that he raped a 14-year-old, You've made a bad documentary about Thomas Jefferson. These reveal themselves to be the sort of films that think it's more important to remember the names of all the presidents as some sort of glorification of the American empire than to actually understand their contributions to society. 
But on the other hand, you could argue that from an educational standpoint, there is an importance to that. You could definitely argue that kids probably do need to have a Sesame Street version of history taught to them before they're able to actually learn the hard truths of what really happened. The point is that while it might be more satisfying in a timeline to say that all History Channel content was once the golden standard of journalism and then it just fell off the rails, the truth is that from the very beginning, history featured the sort of content we associate with it just to a more benign and less comedic degree. If one sees the show Ancient Aliens as a more bloated and exaggerated version of the Unsolved Mysteries UFO segments, then the middle ground between them is Ancient Mysteries, a 1994 History Channel series hosted by Leonard Nimoy. Perhaps our cosmic visitors were here many times, at the beginning of human history. Perhaps they brought with them a message from the stars that may still lie buried within these stones and ruins. What would happen if extraterrestrials landed on the White House lawn? I don't think uh, people would panic. I think uh, they'd be more worried about what would happen to the stock market nowadays. Ten years later, in 2004, the network premiered CONSPIRACY QUESTION MARK? A show whose sole purpose in existing was to analyze recent historical events and then make it seem probable that they were all part of some secret scheme. In other words, the channel was platforming conspiracy theories in order to increase ratings. This is a great example of what I talked about in my last video about the motivations of reporting in shows like this. The producers of Conspiracy Question Mark obviously always had to put forward the conclusion that any event they covered was almost certainly some conspiracy. This is bad informative TV by default. The 2003 show Ancient Discoveries is perhaps the missing piece to the puzzle. The show would go through every known ancient civilization and would cover the great accomplishments of these cultures, as well as likely answers to how these different things were done. The only difference between Ancient Discoveries and Ancient Aliens is that Discoveries would explain that Ancient Man was actually smarter than we presume, and Aliens would say that Ancient Man was stupid, and thus their accomplishments are without explanation. However, I think the real thing that caused the content of history to change so suddenly was the sudden obsession cable channels developed with reality television in the mid to late 2000s. So there's this concept that comes attached to a lot of hyper-branded channels that's called Network Decay. The idea is that as networks struggle to compete over time, their content broadens and broadens until the stations become increasingly homogenized. Entering into the early 2010s, it can be hard to tell if a show was made for History Channel, Discovery, Sci-Fi, Travel Channel, Food Network, The Learning Channel, and even Cartoon Network to some extent. As they all started airing reality TV, which is based around extreme characters doing weirdly specific things. And it feels like such a weird, quick transition from one or two of these shows being on history in 2007 to constantly seeing moments like this anytime I turn the station on today. Oh, you're freaking makeup. You're only 14. Everyone does it at school. So you have to look like this to be their friends? You're not going to do this. You're not going to go just try and look like them and try and be the cool kids. You were a cool kid in high school? I, I can't help the fact that I was cool. <laughs> but I didn't have to wear makeup to look cool. I didn't have well, to fit in. Well, you are a stop, guy. Stop, I was the, the guy. God, I was a dude. Stop. And it's easy to see why networks prefer shows like these. They're cheap to produce. You can make like three seasons in a year. You don't need writers. So if there's a strike, you can keep making TV. These people love hamming up the camera and they're good at it, <laughs> and the ratings are almost always killer. These shows don't necessarily demonstrate the end of History Channel being good at history, but their massive success marked the moment where the station sort of shrugged and went, eh, fuck it. And this brings us back around to Ancient Aliens, the phrase, eh, fuck it, personified as 15 seasons of an ongoing TV show. I watched a lot of ancient aliens for this video, and let me tell you how not easy that was. Because this stuff rots your brain. The positive is that by absorbing as much as I could, I really was able to understand the show on a more general scale. I know a lot of you will expect this video to be me going through each and every one of the claims they've ever made and debunking them all one by one, 
But other YouTubers have done that better, and as I'll talk about later, this show is constructed in a way that's pretty much impossible to really debunk just by knocking down a few odd specific arguments. I'm more generally interested in talking about the format and the themes of its own existence. One of the first things I noticed when watching is that the show does this brilliantly deceptive thing, where they tend to mix legitimate sources with total nutjobs during information collages. So they'll interview someone with an Oxford history degree and have them talk about how the Aztecs had an impressive sewer system, and then they'll cut to some sci-fi author with no credentials, and he is the guy who says, what if that sewer system was built by aliens? It's essentially the same trick that Tiger King pulls off. Half the people in the documentary are trustable, and this tricks the audience into believing the whole narrative put forward, even if the reputable people only put forward a non-essential piece. And it's when we look into the backgrounds of the essential characters who are interviewed that things become a little more clear. Ancient Aliens presents itself as a documentary trying to reveal the truth about history, but in actuality, it's really a show about mythology. And not ancient mythology, but American, middle-class, 1950s folklore. Roswell, Grey Aliens, H.P. Lovecraft to some extent. The goal of these speakers is to make said folklore seem like a total reality, and they have motivation to do that. Most of them are public speakers about UFOs and aliens. They sell books, they go to conventions, they charge you money to take photos with them. Their bank accounts depend on people believing that aliens are real and on Earth. And thus, they'll probably come to the conclusion that anything they see has to be aliens, no matter what. I mean, for God's sakes, the cultures they present in this show aren't even allowed to invent basketball without that being blamed on aliens. The players would knock a rubber ball through a stone hoop. It's thought that this is a representation of alignments of the sun. I actually find it hard to disprove a lot of what's said on this show, because when I look into proving or disproving something, I think, what did they say? What did they mean to say? What's their source on that information? But half the time, they just make stuff up on the spot, and I don't know where they're getting any of the things they're saying. If you take antibiotics and you treat them in the pyramid, the uh, power of the antibiotic was multiplied tens of thousands of times. Here's an episode where they claim that statues are alive. Geologists point out that stone is not as lifeless as it might appear. Rocks and us are made of the same exact thing. The famous statues on Easter Island were said to be alive, but eventually there was a revolution on Easter Island, and they had to kill the statues. They would snap the neck of the statue. What archaeologists have done today is re-erected them on platforms, put the heads back on. Did these statues actually have some energy or power? I know you guys want me to do a big deep dive down the rabbit hole here, just presenting a ton of evidence, but what do you expect me to say? Hey, I, I did six months of research overseas, and it turns out the Easter Island heads, they're rocks, apparently. Later on in the same episode, they claim that all of these statues are transport beacons, or maybe internet modems. Uh, they can't decide from one minute to the next. And again, like, how do you want me to debunk that? How do you want me to debunk that Aztec statues are internet modems? Backtracking a bit, did this dude just claim that all of the Easter Island heads were once knocked over and that archaeologists put them all back up? Do you realize how impossible that is? A lot of the Easter Island heads have been sitting in place so long that the Earth has actually risen around them, and those statues have full bodies which almost no one has ever seen. There are other episodes of the show where they talk about this. They've done like five episodes about the Easter Island heads, and every time they come to a different stupid conclusion. A lot of times on this show, they talk about the concept of energy, and they never define what energy actually is. Half of the time they just say, this item has immense energy, and we're supposed to guess that there's some scientific meaning to that specific phrase, despite the fact that no one seems to have any idea what it means. Karnak as a place is highly charged with energy. 
as you walk down these stone corridors, you can feel this charge. The placement of the pyramids are very interesting because they seem to be placed where the energy is. And I think the ancients understood this very carefully. I think that these stones are transmitting energy. The stone statues become vessels of this cosmic energy. Building a crystal in the exact shape of the human cranium does have some sort of energetic quality. Ancient Aliens is structured almost exactly like a MatPat video. Now, if you've never seen a MatPat video, if you've never watched Game Theory, let me fill you in on what most of his videos are like. MatPat will set up a potential theory. He'll spend an excessive amount of time explaining what the details of that theory would entail, what it would mean, and at the very moment where you expect him to show any substantial evidence that proves that there is substance to this theory being real in any way, he distracts you with some stupid bullshit. It might be a joke, it might be a tangent, it might be a skit, but when the distraction is over, he just starts over and begins explaining a new theory that also doesn't have any evidence. And it's hard to say that he's lying, because MatPat's videos aren't really theories. They're open-ended questions that are meant to be left up to your imagination. Every guest speaker on this show, except for this guy, usually avoids saying that any idea is actually true, instead simply stating that it might be true, and that's all that really matters. Is it possible that during the genetic manipulation of human beings, we at one point started out as Sasquatch and Bigfoot and Yetis? And the answer is a potential yes. That's why in every single episode, the narrator always says the words, Is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? But is it possible? This is the core gimmick of Ancient Aliens. They never put the burden of proof on themselves, but instead casually glide off the fact that what they are presenting are overwhelmingly unfalsifiable claims. They can't prove themselves right, but I can't prove them wrong. And even if I did go through and pick apart dozens of examples they bring up, the speakers would just fall back on different pieces of evidence. The way you prove the ancient astronaut theory is not with one single piece of evidence. It is a conglomeration of different puzzle pieces. And when you really start to listen to these guest speakers, it's usually pretty obvious that a whole lot of them don't know anything about ancient cultures, and they're just sort of talking out their ass. He is got a beard and a mustache. And that is an unusual thing because American Indians do not have beards and mustaches. Exactly. The fact also that the beard and the mustache are so pronounced. They're, they're not little wispy ones. They're major, so... People are going to be really mad that I pointed this out, but, uh... Have you ever noticed all the guest speakers on Ancient Aliens are really, uh... White? That's weird, right? Because this show is primarily about analyzing the culture of people of color in ancient history, and yet the only times I ever seem to notice a local being interviewed is to just give basic facts about the area. The locals are never the people claiming that it was actually aliens. The show is still on the air, it's got almost 200 episodes, and they're still making more of them, so I'm sure there are exceptions. But anytime I see it on TV, it's always a white dude describing things that non-white people did, saying that it was impossible for how undeveloped they were, and then saying that it had to be aliens. How could the Easter Islanders have invented their own writing without some other cultural influence. They're doing things that would require precision work. How could they have had these advanced machining tools? The one answer would have to be they've gotten it from ancient aliens. The Mayans could not possibly have developed these systems on their own. So it is clear that they were given to them by aliens out there. Of course, the ongoing narrative of these moments is clearly a somewhat contradictory lack of respect for these civilizations and their people. Their art is interesting enough to analyze, their accomplishments impressive enough to praise, and yet 
the hosts always come back around to directly or indirectly saying that they were too unsophisticated to have accomplished any of this without outside help, which is an opinion that they never seem to come to about European churches or castles or anything like that. Clearly, someone told the local people how to place these stones into different areas. So you're surmising the technology was given to these people. The engineering yeah. knowledge, yeah. because this screams mathematics. I will certainly concur to this extent. Someone or some ones had extraordinary knowledge here. This is not easy to build. No. The funniest thing about this show to me is that if you believe all of these guest speakers, and you think that 90% of the accomplishments of people of color were done with the help of aliens, and meanwhile we have Stonehenge and nothing else, doesn't that imply that aliens don't like white people? I mean, aliens were going across the globe throughout all of early civilizations and meeting with all these different people and helping them invent things and helping stack structures and building pyramids for them except for us what did we do what did we do that made aliens avoid talking to us for the rest of human civilization i posted that joke on twitter and a couple select people got really, really mad. So now, in my ongoing fight to make everyone on the internet mad, I'm officially selling Aliens Don't Like White People merchandise on Redbubble. Get yourself some Aliens Don't Like White People t-shirts, coffee mugs, blankets, shower curtains, deliver this message to the world with the utmost pride. Link in the description. Anyways, y'all wanna see some alien titties? Within these caves are different murals we find some of the most amazing paintings of people emerging out of the clouds. And they're actually floating in midair. What a beautiful poetic way to depict something that they might have witnessed. It was a complete misunderstanding of a visitation by technologically advanced space travelers. If there's one word you hear in almost every episode of Ancient Aliens, especially from this guy, it's misunderstood or misinterpreted. Every time he talks about an ancient legend or a piece of art, it's the locals misunderstanding what they were really seeing, which he then uses to circle it all back around to legends that he personally believes in. I see an astronaut in a helmet. I'm immediately reminded of misunderstood technology. It was some type of misunderstood technology, an extraterrestrial tool, because we didn't understand. Was it really flying snakes or gods that were snakes? Of course not. It was misunderstood technology. Now, of course it wasn't a dragon in a biological nature, but it was a misinterpreted machine. They were misinterpreted flesh and blood extraterrestrials. A flesh and blood extraterrestrial whom our ancestors misinterpreted as being God. When it all comes down to it, it was all a huge misunderstanding. To me, this is the equivalent of reading through ancient religions and trying to argue that each and every one was actually Jesus in a wig trying to mess with people. This is something that white people just generally tend to do a lot. Whenever we come up with our own folklore that is sort of unsubstantiated, we try and make it seem more legitimate by pointing to the cultures of other people and saying, look, they saw the same thing, they just didn't understand what they saw because they're stupid. This is something you see a lot in Bigfoot culture in America. Various hunters and locals will always claim that American Indians had stories of Bigfoot, but when you look into it, it's just some various mythical beast that has nothing to do with Sasquatch. But the Bigfoot hunters roll their eyes and say, Oh, for the love of God, it was Bigfoot. They just didn't know what they saw. Our beliefs and our culture are one-to-one -one with reality, but the beliefs and cultures of minorities are skewed and warped because they aren't as smart as we are. This is, at best, cultural appropriation, and at worst, immaculate stupidity. 
I originally had a lot more to say about Bigfoot, but I realized that doing it right would just take up far too much time in the script. So if you guys want to see a Bigfoot video, you know, leave a comment below because I actually still don't know if it's a good idea or not. It is worth pointing out though that there is an episode of Ancient Aliens that claims that Bigfoot is an alien because the show is basically a parody of itself. We can't rule it out as a possibility that Bigfoot are somehow an extraterrestrial species. One of the most annoying things about Ancient Aliens is that the show is not only promoting pseudo-archaeology, but it's making it harder for real archaeologists to do their job. One of the biggest examples to me is Pumapunku. Pumapunku is one of the most mysterious locations on Earth because we really only have theories about how they built it or what it was for. But one of the main reasons we know so little about it is that people keep going to Pumapunku and just taking shit. And it's mostly ancient astronaut vacationers who are taking these artifacts home and probably destroying them in search of magnetic energy or dragon eggs or whatever they believe in that week. This is something they do in the show. They take an artifact from Pumapunku back to America and they start cutting it up with power tools. They use a laser cutter and a diamond saw and it's all just so this old dude can go, wow, the laser saw and the diamond saw cuts, they look different from the ones at Pumapunku. Of course they do! Why would ancient Bolivians have power tools? If you're gonna take ancient artifacts home with you, that's bad. You're a bad person. But at least, like, Put them in a museum or something, or put them on your shelf like your fucking Fraser. Don't run around cutting up ancient artifacts. I mean, for the love of God, we know what kind of stones were used at Pumapunku. Just get the same kind of stone and do your stupid little science fair experiments on that. Don't go around cutting up ancient artifacts in human history in your surreal stupid hunt to prove that UFOs are real. You're not Nicholas Cage. Age, dipshit! This is hacksaw archaeology. This is backyardigans archaeology. I mean, this big haired motherfucker has a degree in sports information communication. Why are we allowing him to run around destroying ancient artifacts in his ongoing pursuit to consistently prove all of his theories wrong? Another episode of the show features this guest speaker and blindly supports his theory that a group of mounds in Bosnia are ancient pyramids that have been covered up by soil. He notes that this makes them the largest pyramids in known human history. This is all absolutely not true. These are hills. They slope up because that's what hills do. So what this guy has been doing has been raising money to go in and reshape the hills to look like pyramids, which he calls excavating lost sites. And in doing so, he's actually been destroying real archaeologically important locations in order to support this conspiracy theory that he's essentially invented in his own mind. And the reason he's been doing this is because this not only has bred a massive tourism industry, but has instilled a nationalist belief that the people living there descended from one of the most impressive ancient civilizations of all time. Many politicians have supported this conspiracy, and naysayers have been accused of being anti-Bosnian. What Ancient Aliens really supports in segments like this is something that used to be extremely common, but is now actively fought against, and that is archaeology with motivation. People used to say that archaeologists around the world would hunt for the past with a pickaxe in one hand and a Bible in the other. And because of that bias, a lot of the discoveries people made in the 20th century are now being questioned, and it's being asked if we've lost key moments in history because experts have become obsessed with proving their own biases correct, be it a belief in God or a belief in an advanced alien race. And this issue highlights exactly what we should and shouldn't be doing with our history books. It's not a question of what we can disprove, but what we can prove with utmost certainty. Running around arguing that certain unlikely situations must be considered simply by lack of not being certainly untrue is ludicrous and a waste of everyone's time. 
and arguing that impressive accomplishments of foreign cultures couldn't have been accomplished without concepts invented by modern American folklore is just insulting. Basically, this whole section of this video has been a long-winded way of arguing, say it with me now, just because white people couldn't do it, doesn't mean it was aliens. Look, Ancient Aliens was the thing all of you came to hear me dunk on. It's even what the thumbnail is based around. But to me, it's no more than a roadside attraction in the story of History Channel. Because it's child's play to get the past wrong, and History Channel has done it time and time again. But what's really impressive is to get the future wrong every single time. December 21st, 2012. Daybreak doesn't come. All remains dark. The world has come to an end. Is 2012 the year the cosmic clock finally winds down to zero days, zero hope? Definitely, some of the gods will return. There's absolutely no doubt. So, over the next two weeks, I'm going to be covering a couple additional topics which could have fit into this video, but would have made it like an hour and ten minutes long. And believe it or not, right now I'm really worried about making content that people actually feel comfortable clicking on. So they're going to be fun videos, um, they're going to be sort of tangentially related to History Channel, and uh, it's just going to be some interesting little side voyages. And the first one is going to be talking about 2012 documentaries, and this one is just going to be fun, we're just going to shit on these, and trust me, there's a lot of funny stuff in there. So uh, come back next week and we're going to be doing that. If you don't want to miss this, remember to go down and hit subscribe and click that bell, set it to all notifications. And uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to stay up to date with how that next video is coming along. With that, this has been my Quentin Quarantine, and that's all you need. These glasses are so good, aliens must have made them. So one of my favorite casual pastimes when I was a kid was going through my father's VHS collection and basically watching whatever I found, usually meaning I was watching stuff from long before I was born. One of the things I remember finding is a hilarious film titled The Man Who Saw Tomorrow. Begrudgingly starring a frozen peas era Orson Welles, the film covers Nostradamus' vague and bizarre texts and claims that they could predict the future. It not only makes the case for recent catastrophes and events being proof of that, but also goes out of its way to predict what would happen in the next 20 years. And man oh man, do the late 80s get crazy, my dudes. May, 1988. The great famine do I see drawing near. A famine so great and so long that man shall become a man-eater. In 1994. So this could be the year in which the Third World War begins. In the Soviet Union, the United States will be friends. And after a peace for a thousand years, ah! I could watch Orson Welles be wrong about the future all day. Couldn't you? Every few years, a couple different stations will essentially remake The Man Who Saw Tomorrow, entirely because every version of the film that's ever been made has gotten all of its predictions wrong. In fact, apparently the version I watched as a kid wasn't the original, but was instead a Gulf War-style 1991 remake that also got everything wrong. This trend continued up to and beyond December 2012, when many people were very, 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 very convinced that the world was going to come to an end. When the sun is rising in this dark rift, it's going to be bad. In the years leading up to this, History Channel filled its schedule to the brim with programming meant to capitalize off of this. There was a time where you could turn on the channel at any time of the day, and they would almost certainly be discussing prophecies of the end of the world. Today, a lot of these things are really hard to find, because History Channel has no motivation to redistribute them. 
Not only is it hard to find them on DVD, but the History Channel website is almost scrubbed clean of any evidence of them. And the reason is that these shows are embarrassing, and are a full frontal look at just how useless this kind of programming actually is. And right, let's just hit a Pirate Bay and see if that has anything. Eh, barely any cedars, but we'll see if we can get some of these to work. You've got mail. Oh, I got an email. I wonder what that's about. Oh no. Oh no! My internet provider found out I've been watching movies online. They're gonna call the police. I'm gonna go to jail. They're gonna waterboard me until I tell them where I downloaded my AVI of Shrek 2. Uh, yeah. So there was a sponsor here, but uh, I'm 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 gonna cut it. I'm gonna cut it for the compilation. So there was a sponsor here. It's gone now. So why did people think the world was going to end? on December 21st, 2012. Well, it stems partially from a misunderstanding of the Maya calendar. This is what a typical date on the Maya long date calendar looks like. When we take that and convert it into Arabic numbers, it looks like this. This might seem overwhelming at first, but it's essentially just a slightly more nested version of our calendar system. You see this fifth number on the far right? This goes up every 24 hours. It represents a single day passing. Every 20 days, that number resets to zero, and the fourth digit goes up by one. The fourth digit is basically a Mayan month. It's like our months, except there's 20 days every single time, and there's no Halloween or Christmas. When 17 Mayan months pass, that number also resets, and the middle digit goes up. The middle digit translates to 360 days, roughly one year. Every 20 Mayan years, the middle digit crosses over, and every 354 years, the next to last digit also does the same thing. The far left digit is called a Baktun today, and marks the cycle starting over, which happens every 144,000 days. This is what the calendar looked like on December 20th, 2012. You can see it's sort of a mess, it's all these numbers, it's a mathematical conundrum to figure out what all this means. And here's what happened that very night. Pretty cool, huh? It's like watching an odometer turn over. The Maya culture had a creation myth which stated that the gods formed this world at the moment where all of these numbers were at zero, which in our calendar was roughly the year 3114 BCE. They also claimed that our world was actually the fourth created by the gods, who kept rebooting until they got villagers who weren't ugly, and that the third world was erased on its 13th Baktun. So would our world be destroyed on the exact same date? The Maya certainly didn't seem to think so. While they occasionally mention the date as noteworthy within incomplete texts, their planetary charts span into the 15th Baktun, about 1500 years into our future. One could speculate that this is indeed what they thought would happen on the 13th Baktun, but you could also imagine that it was just exciting to imagine that their world would one day be older than the version that came before it. At this stage of the game, we're really just guessing. What really happened to lead up to the 2012 phenomenon was that the idea of the world ending became this suspenseful bit of socio-culture that people really latched onto. This was bred not only by sci-fi shows like The X-Files referencing the date, but also decades of different figures and programs exploiting fear in the public of the uncertainty in the future. Arguably this started in the late 1970s, when many televangelists attempted to breed dependence in their business models by selling predictions of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Pat Robertson specifically was very adamant that before the 1980s were through, civilization would come to an end and only righteous TV-watching Christians would be spared. In 19... well, I'd give it 1982, but date setting is dangerous. Around the same time, a parody religion titled The Church of the Subgenius began growing popular among some counterculture teenagers and college students. Its core teachings were based around a fictional 1950s businessman named J.R. or Bob Dobbs, who had made spiritual connection with aliens and had been shown future events. The church soon presented their own apocalypse theory to compete with those of televangelists, replacing the fear in Christ with a post-ironic take on UFO culture, purposefully unbelievable and soaked in science fiction nonsense. According to the text, 
there exists a planet at the furthest reaches of our galaxy known as Planet X. In the future, our planet and Planet X will cross paths, and this will mark the end to civilization as we know it. On July 5th, 1998, at 7 a.m., the so-called Men from Planet X, or Exists, shall make a mass landing on this planet. The children of Bob shall be rewarded at this foretold rupture, this day of judgment when all those who paid their church dues will be lifted up in power and glory to gain new homes and bodies aboard the pleasure saucers of the sex goddesses. All the while watching the hapless pinks twitch and bleat and wail in the death throes of their world. Inexplicably, this joke conspiracy invented by a joke cult actually evolved into being something people unironically believed in around a decade later. In 1995, a woman named Nancy Leiter gained notoriety for an online blog she created titled Zeta Talk. On Zeta Talk, she made a series of outrageous claims that, you could argue, were directly ripped off from the story of Bob Dobbs. Leiter claimed that she had gained a spiritual connection with a group of aliens, and that they had shown her a vision of the future. She stated that these aliens were from a planet hidden at the edge of our galaxy called Planet X, and predicted that in the next few years a catastrophic event would occur when Planet X and Earth came into contact. Her blog widely speculated on what would happen once Planet X arrived inventing numerous different scenarios and situations. For instance, one claim she had was that the planets aligning along with Planet X would cause the magnetic fields of Earth to totally shift, causing devastating effects, with this taking place on May the 5th, 2000. She later changed this date to 2003, which became the concrete accepted date until that passed as well. So you've survived the pole shift. Congratulations. Well, now what? Can't go shopping as the roads are all torn up, bridges are down, your local stores have probably been looted by now in any case. Perhaps you've stocked up, you have canned or dried foods and lots of clean water at hand. Supplies allow a transition time, getting over the shock of the pole shift, treating the injured and saying goodbye to those who didn't make it. Having a strong cup of coffee and a plate of rice and beans during this time almost seems a necessity. I hear that. 90% of humanity is dead, but as long as I got my coffee, who gives a damn? This tangent might seem entirely pointless to the discussion, but the majority of beliefs about 2012 in pseudo-historical circles were copied and pasted from this woman's blog, which, again, seems to have totally ripped off its content from a 1980s parody religion. The Zeta Talk Triangle appeared multiple times in crop circles in Horicon Marsh in Wisconsin in 2003, my home state, making the point that Zeta Talk has validity and Nancy as the Zeta Talk emissary should be trusted. Considering that the information presented in these documentaries has such a disheveled and confusing lineage, it's not shocking that there's actually not a lot of agreement in the content over what would really happen in 2012. Depending on where you got your info, either alignments of the planets would create the previously mentioned pole shift causing storms that would destroy cities all over the world, a comet would fall from the sky wiping out humans like it did the dinosaurs, Earth would collide with Planet X destroying both planets, aliens from Planet X would return marking a new age in human history, or maybe just all of those things would happen at once. Y2K really had its branding down, didn't it? Computers get confused and think it's 1900, they all short circuit. Boom, simple. Most of the claims these documentaries peddled were complete nonsense, as you can imagine. For instance, it was often mentioned in these productions how the Sun, Earth, and the center of the Milky Way galaxy would line up, something which is supposedly astronomically rare. For the first time in 26,000 years, the Earth is lining up with the galactic center of our Milky Way galaxy. The Earth will be in exact alignment with the Sun and the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Sun will align with the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Earth, the Sun, and this birth canal, the Dark Rift, are all in perfect alignment. 
and this only happens every 25,800 years. Every 26,000 years. And that sounds pretty impressive when you hear it. How could it be a coincidence that this happens on the exact day of this important Mayan date? But according to the skeptics website nasa.gov, that happens literally every December. And as you can probably tell from all these collages, these experts were all using each other as sources, and thus probably no one is really sure who is coming up with all this bullshit. What's more important to these guest speakers isn't really their information being right, but their own biases being proven correct. And if that means seeing patterns where patterns don't exist, then by God, they're gonna do that. One of the first programs to exploit 2012 anxiety was a 2005 History Channel show titled Decoding the Past, which attempted to use historical texts to make apocalypse predictions. The most memorable episode of this show is titled The Bible Code, and makes the case that if you type the Bible out with no spaces, you can use it as a crossword puzzle, and words that are closer to each other will predict the future. In order to perform a search, the letters are arranged in a grid or matrix, making it easier to perform the search and allowing the results to be clearly shown. Watergate. Who is he? President. But he will be kicked out. Muslim. Airplane. Attack. Twin Towers. Twice. Chemical Weapons. And Becca. Damascus. Which could be interpreted to mean that the much sought after weapons of mass destruction may have been sent from Iraq through Damascus, Syria to the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah, okay, right, yeah, the weapons of mass destruction Bush keeps talking about are real, a very good prediction to make in 2005. The code seems to suggest that man's end may come in the form of a comet hitting the Earth in the year 2012. Comet, 5772, Earth annihilated. But another code matrix seems to suggest a different outcome. Comet, it will be crumbled. I will tear to pieces. 2012. Oof, big thanks for choosing that second one, Jesus. Good to know that our future is constantly a multiple choice test that you're just bullshitting. 2012 documentaries are amazing, because all these theorists have no consistency in their theories, so it's literally just the guest speakers randomly making stuff up because they have no idea how the world is supposed to really end. The Earth's magnetic field is in the process of changing and perhaps weakening in spots. And anybody who's ever watched Star Trek, you know, the shields are down. Bad. Within the next year, there probably won't be any ice on the North Pole in the summertime. For the first time in all of recorded human history. And once you change the rotation of the Earth, you do have a chance of causing huge effects. Could it replace the land with the sea and the sea with the land? What? That's the one. No, that's the one we're going with. That's what that's what happened, man. That that's how 2012 went down. The land and the sea, uh, they swapped places. This bit went up there, this bit went down there. It was like Freaky Friday, but everyone died. Anyways, y'all want to see some galactic alignment titties? Closer examination of this image reveals an intriguing symbolism. Sagittarius's arrow and the woman form a cross that resembles the galactic alignment. Wow, dude, good find there. Good good Easter egg you, you uncovered with your uh, detective skills on that one. Can we make this the new loss? Like, like this is 2012. Look, I found plenty of documentaries about 2012 that were essentially nothing but fear baiting about how horrible it's going to be with no other consensus beyond that. Anyone can do this, and they're all exactly the same. But it takes a true man, a true legend, a legitimate hero, to not only say the world might end tomorrow, but also, I'm gonna stop it. The Lost Crystal Skulls. Legend tells us there are 13 of them. Together, they are said to contain the secrets of the universe. Secrets that some claim will save mankind from an Armageddon prophesized by the ancient Mayan calendar. Legends tell us 
They must be reunited to prevent the coming doomsday. With the clock ticking, can we track down the remaining skulls before it's too late? Join us as we attempt to solve the mystery of the Crystal Skulls. I want to give a big thanks to this person in my Patreon Discord who found a copy of this after I described what I remembered about it in the chat. I've constantly been thinking about this since the first time I saw it as a kid, and I'm so excited to share it with you guys. Airing on sci-fi back when sci-fi was spelled right, this documentary is based around the idea that if this random dude can find the remaining crystal skulls, he can use their raw power to stop the world ending in 2012. Now, some of you might be shocked to find out that the Crystal Skulls are a real thing outside of Indiana Jones. And you'll be perhaps even more surprised to find out that they actually aren't a real thing at all. In the late 1800s, snobby people around the world started collecting ancient artifacts, and because there was more demand than supply, forgeries flooded the market. These Crystal Skulls were one of the many things that were invented by European scam artists. And it was so successful that one skull ended up in a British museum. Years later, a man named Mitchell Hedges claimed to have found an identical skull during a Mayan excavation in the 1920s. He stated that he snuck it out of the country and kept it a secret for two decades. However, recent documents have proved that he simply bought it from a collector around 1943 and then invented a tall tale about it. All testing of the known skulls have consistently proved that they were made with tools that are modern by nature, dating them essentially to just before they were discovered. This is so well known that even the Indiana Jones film is written with the conceit that while the skulls are real within the universe, all of the skulls we found in the real world are entirely fraudulent, with Mitchell Hedge's name being used as a synonym for fakery. There are a number of crystal skulls in the world. I saw one in the British Museum. Interesting craftsmanship, but that's about it. When documentaries like this describe the story of the 13 crystal skulls and say, according to legend, what they mean is the stories that Mitchell Hedges says the Maya told him. And since all evidence seems to suggest that Hedges was a pathological liar and made the entire story up, this implies that these legends don't really exist. Fun fact! Around the time 2012 was happening, someone claimed to have found a crystal skull in the former home of high-ranking Nazi Heinrich Himmler. This was really obviously a hoax, but during a photo shoot with the thing, some guy dropped it and it broke? And then the Daily Mail ran an article saying that the world was gonna end and it was his fault. Going back to the sci-fi presentation we were looking at before, this is one of the funniest films I have ever seen in my entire life. The entire thing is this one guy wandering around different parts of Guatemala, looking for the rest of the skulls, and he doesn't find shit. It's that for 90 minutes, it's entirely boring, and it's the greatest thing ever. I feel that there's still a number of crystal skulls still left. I'm just kind of drawn to this place. Yeah, this is an opening, this is a doorway, and I hope I'm gonna try to open it up and see what's down in this thing. The clock is ticking. All of the original 13 crystal skulls must be found and in place before 2012. Still ahead, a grueling hike leads to the unexpected. Have we stumbled on the remains of Atlantis? <laughs> I don't know, have you? I'm gonna have to keep watching. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, going to, to, to some ancient civilization you've never gone to, and then just hiking around until you find the first slightly ancient thing you can see, and immediately going, Oh shit! Was this Atlantis? Did I, did I just find it? <laughs> Is this Atlantis? There's this great scene where he comes across this random structure in the woods, which must be known to real archaeologists, and he's convinced that this is part of an underground secret structure that holds some of the remaining crystal skulls, and then he turns to the camera and says, I gotta apply for a permit. Yeah, it might take a few years, but once the paperwork is filled out, I can start excavating here. 2014 at the latest. Watch this thing he does with the machete. He didn't yeah, that's a classic archaeological move right there. 
just shove a big knife into the place you're trying to excavate and see what sound it makes. But Bill Holman is a man of action. He's an eighth degree grandmaster. It's hard not to laugh at this guy, but at the same time buried under all of this is a really sad element to the story. This guy was best friends with the 100 year old daughter of Mitchell Hedges and spent her last years taking care of her and talking about the skull. This was recorded about a year after she died. And it's pretty sad just how much he connects the hunt for the skulls with this memory of her, like finding the skulls would prove something. And this is what you consistently see in stories like this. It always seems like a perfect mix of total scam artists who are only in it for fame and fortune, and people who are so genuinely emotionally invested in a story being true that they can't bring themselves to let it go. And it makes dunking on these people almost not fun. Although on the other hand... Is this Atlantis? <laughs> Whenever there's a prediction about the end of the world, we always come back around to the final, final step in our journey. Bargaining. When the predictors desperately want you to believe that they actually weren't wrong about their predictions and that they shouldn't be laughed at on the streets for their massive, massive failure. The first thing you can try and do is claim that you technically weren't wrong, you just guesstimated some details incorrectly and the things you got right are far more impressive. This is most commonly seen in predictions revolving around politics and war, and those which are interpreting the texts of figures like Nostradamus. So even if you say something entirely ridiculous, like Ted Kennedy may become president of the United States. The sort of vague half-correctness in a couple of your other points will seem much more worthy of mention to people who are into that kind of thing. If you're currently writing a prediction and you want to be able to pull a stunt like this in the future, your best bet is to just throw in a sentence that sounds something like, In the future, there will be conflict in the Middle East. The next major war to be fought in the world is going to be right here. But most apocalypse theories aren't vague, they go straight to the fire and brimstone, and so they get absolutely everything wrong. So the next style of bargaining is to just yell, Uh oh, SpaghettiOs, I got the year wrong, as you continue to move your goalpost further and further down the line. When Pat's prediction of 1982 being the end didn't work out, he moved the year to 1985, and then 1996, and then 2007, before he finally took the L. Famously, when the 1998 prediction passed and aliens from Planet X did not arrive on Earth, many members of the Church of the Subgenius argued that the year had accidentally been read upside down and that they would actually arrive in 8661. Other children of Bob argue that our calendar is simply incorrect and that the year 1998 still hasn't happened. But I love 2012 bargaining specifically because it really started to happen before the date had even arrived, as these guest speakers realized that they had based their entire integrity in the world actually coming to an end. Either they were going to die, or they were going to be a joke for the rest of their lives. And so they started trying to pitch these compromises that were a lot less severe, but all of those compromises also definitely didn't happen. Where will a spiritually based science lead us after December 21st of the year 2012? I really don't think that there'll be any great shift on the morning of December 21st, 2012. The UFOs won't land, the comet won't hit that morning, but it'll be a point in which looking back, we can all say, oh yeah, that's when it all ended. <laughs> I wish, man. I wish. Hear me out. Think about how better the world would be if it had actually ended in 2012. The stock market never would have crashed, poverty rate would be down to zero, we finally would have gotten Coney. This is a bad bit. Okay, so in a minute I'm gonna do something which I really don't usually do on this channel, and that is I'm going to tell you guys about my next two videos. I'm going to tell you what those videos are going to be, and a sense of when they're going to be uploaded, 
And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm pretty happy with what these two videos are going to be, but I'm also somewhat sure that YouTube just isn't going to push them at all, so I kind of need you guys to look out for them. The first thing is going to be a conclusion to our discussion about the History Channel as I talk about the very worst of the worst that they have ever put out. Bad Nazi documentaries. This is certainly going to get demonetized, I'm fully aware of that, but talking about the failures of History Channel and not talking about some of the weird shit in that territory would be a huge sin in my opinion. So if you have any suggestions for where you would like me to take that topic, uh, leave those thoughts in the comment section below. But more importantly, those of you who have been following me on Twitter for the last five months will know that I have been working on a huge video about Garfield, specifically analyzing a collection of Garfield Lost Media, which I am planning to release alongside this video. And I have officially decided that that video will be coming out on June the 5th, specifically June the 5th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is going to be one of the biggest videos I've ever done, it's definitely the most expensive, and it's really important to me that people actually see this one. And it's also kind of longer than normal videos, it's about documentary length, which is ironic, and because of that I really feel like YouTube will not naturally recommend it to people, so I would like it if we all bound together as a community and sort of got together on June 5th and enjoyed it together. We'll do a little premiere, we'll get some popcorn, we'll, you and I will hang out in the chat, and we'll have a good time watching, you know, this Garfield extravaganza. If you want to hear more about these next two videos, follow me on Twitter, and if you want to make sure that you don't miss them when I upload, Hit subscribe below and set the bell to all notifications. Okay, play us out, Pat! The Iranians are uh, as if they're trying to provoke the United States to, to war. It's the most amazing thing. They continuously uh, provoke us, provoke us, provoke us. And you can just see the tempers flaring in our nation saying, let's go over there and show those fellows a lesson. It's almost as if something is goading somebody there to bring us against them. Well, when we do that, and we certainly have a right to, then they will be weakened and that will just set them up for a Soviet takeover. With that, I've been quitting reviews. All hail Bob. The following true stories involve a Hitler sex change and exploding pancakes. Viewer discretion is advised. A one, a two, a one, two, three. When discussing History Channel and its evolution into a rabbit hole of madness, it might be tempting to say that it went through an inglorious fall from greatness. A tumble from the shining city on a hill it once occupied. But when studying its content down on a more precise standard, we discover that from its start, the station made certain choices that were heavily questionable even then. Because before history was infamous for its focus on reality TV, or its hunt to present sci-fi conspiracy theories as facts, or its obsession with doomsday apocalypse predictions, it was known by one simple nickname. The Hitler Channel which it gained for its notorious scheduling of sensationalist, around-the-clock documentaries about every aspect of Nazi Germany. Now, it should be clarified, there is absolutely no problem with making documentaries about this particular topic. In fact, a few videos ago, I plugged a documentary which is primarily about what happened at the end of the war, which I still suggest you guys check out if you haven't yet. When done right, a documentary can serve as a historical record which is much more palatable and understandable than real historical record. And there is no place in history where this is more important than the atrocities of the Holocaust. Because we're currently only 10 or 15 years away from there being no survivors left. If there was no way for future generations to understand the horrors that happened on a deep, empathetic level, well, as they say, history might repeat itself. But most of you probably understand that when I say bad Nazi documentaries, these aren't the kind of films that I'm talking about. You remember those guys you knew in high school who were like, 
really into learning about the Nazis, but they never talked about the atrocities committed or lessons to learn. They just sort of argued about which tanks were the best. Those guys work for History Channel now! Or they join the military, it's one of the two. From the moment History Channel started, its perspective on Nazi Germany was sensationalist more than it was educational. One of the first pieces to premiere was titled The Occult History of the Third Reich, and was also one of the first shows to claim that the entirety of Nazi history could be blamed on the supernatural. This is something we'll get into a little more in a moment. Like most of the topics we've talked about in this episode, history was not alone in the phenomenon of sensationalist Nazi films. This is a problem that bleeds from network to network around the turn of the millennium. For instance, HBO infamously aired a film titled Hidden Fuhrer, debating the enigma of Hitler's sexuality. A completely unironic documentary in which a German historian tries to argue that Hitler was a gay man. You, uh, you sure about that one, dude? You might want to look into that one a second time. But when most of you think of general cable documentaries about this topic, Nazi megastructures or Nazi mega weapons are the first things that come to your mind. The multi-titled series, which dares to ask, what if instead of looking at the Nazis through the eyes of their victims, we look at them through the lens of all the tanks they built? Fortress Berlin, super tanks, Hitler's jet caves, Hitler's killer subs, Pacific mega ships, Hitler's war trains, Hitler's island mega fortress. Yes, let's look at the Nazis in the exact way that the Nazis wanted us to look at the Nazis. These sort of sensationalist shows are obsessed with the Wunderwaffel, or Wonder Weapon, Nazi projects, covering them unironically as if they were generally a positive or brilliant thing in the war effort. And the reason that this narrative makes for good clickbait TV is the exact same reason that it made for a brilliant propaganda program. It instills a belief that there is something ultimately supreme about the Third Reich and how it orchestrated the war. And that can be either inspiring or scary, depending on who you were at the time. There is actually an episode of Ancient Aliens about Nazi Germany, and I avoided watching it for my Ancient Aliens video because I knew it would fit better in this one. Instead of an intense breakdown of all the arguments, I thought it would be more fitting to just set a camera up and film my reactions to all the stupid bullshit they say. But if the Bell was not a new type of aircraft, then what was it? According to some ancient astronaut theorists, the Bell may have been a time machine. There have been rumors for many, many years that they went to another planet. The ironic thing about all of this is years later in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, a similar object was witnessed is it possible that the Nazis perfected these things? Or is it possible that the aliens looked like Nazis in uniforms? How bizarre would that be? This video is gonna fucking kill me, man. There's this big misconception in modern culture that the Nazis were bad people, but they were bad people at the cost of being superhuman geniuses. This is reflective of the belief many people have that cruelty is indicative of hyperdevelopment. People who believe in this often will state that a lot of our modern understanding of biology stems from experiments done by Nazi scientists on the Jewish people. This is not true in the slightest. There is no authenticity to that at all, and it's essentially a white supremacist conspiracy theory. That doesn't mean that if you believe in it, you automatically are a white supremacist. It simply means that you are susceptible to propaganda. When you actually go back and study all of the things that the Nazis are praised for today, you find not only maliciousness, but also stupidity. The Nazis were morons, and this is something people just don't talk about today. Their ideology of genetic supremacy caused them to be pious, 
and that led to headstrong tactics that failed them time and time again. When you watch these Wonder Waffle documentaries, you'll often see guest speakers brag about just how ginormous and big these weapons are. Nazi Germany produces a series of bigger panzers with bigger guns. So if you start to make the gun bigger, everything else will get bigger accordingly. But the thing is, war isn't a card game meant for children. It's not about having the highest stats out of anyone else on the playing field. I can build the biggest, bulkiest, most expensive plane ever, covered in skulls, and ship it out. But if I then just crash it into a cliffside, I've simply wasted time and resources. How useful are these big, threatening tanks when they break down constantly and no one knows how to move them from the battlefield? Or when they're snowed in because no one planned for there being snow in Russia? The Wonder Waffle program was an absolute failure. Most of the things they spent years working on didn't get past the prototype stage, and a lot of what did go into production simply wasn't useful in the war. And most of these were simply used by German corporations to bleed endless money from the Nazi government. More people died working on the V-2 rocket than were killed in battle by the V-2 rocket. Today, in the German language, Wunderwaffel is used exclusively in an ironic sense, as if to say, oh yeah, that's gonna be our wonder weapon, right. And while the Germans were wasting their time on impractical ego weapons that they couldn't use, the Allied powers were sending out fake armies made out of blow-up tanks and dropping bodies by the shore with fake intel in their pockets. They were using Looney Tunes tactics, and it worked. Because the Third Reich was made up of a bunch of big-headed buffoons obsessed with believing in their own worth. If the Nazis really were geniuses of conflict, if they had technology beyond our wildest understanding, if their skulls swelled constantly to maintain their massively expanding brains, they would have won the fucking war. Breaking down these Nazi documentaries can be very important, because I recently realized just how much of my understanding of this topic has been based around films that I saw growing up. For one example, the Ancient Aliens episode I showed earlier was talking about a supposed Nazi superweapon called Die Glock, or The Bell, which they claim was a flying saucer slash time machine. I've heard about this for years, and I've always presumed that it was some sort of misunderstood blueprint for a bomb or a tank that never really got into production. But it turns out that the bell never really existed in any form. It was invented by Polish author Iger Witowski in 2000 for a sensationalist book he was writing. I'm only bringing him up to point out that he looks like a perfect mix of Kevin Spacey and Alex Jones. What this reveals to us is that modern pseudo-historians can just make things up, even about extremely infamous times in the past, and they can rework how the general culture tends to perceive that issue, without even really trying. Another claim you'll often hear from these shows is that the Nazis were obsessed with the occult. This is true only to the extent that they seem to think they were destined by divine force to rule, and that apparently some Nazis were into astrology. Those are also things you could say about a lot of rulers in American history. This is often used to claim that the Nazis were looking for ancient artifacts or occult objects that they could use to rule. This is basically just something that these people saw in a Steven Spielberg movie and they took it at face value, like a bunch of idiots. The Nazis were not actively searching for the Crystal Skulls. They didn't have an obsession with finding religious relics. These are just claims invented by eccentrics to make their interests seem more legitimate. Which, it's weird to say, my thing is real because the Nazis were really into it, but it's a common thread in pieces like this. Let's take a look at one of the first big History Channel documentaries to ever talk about Hitler and the Nazis. Occultists believe Hannison may have also imparted occult techniques of mind control and crowd domination. Oh wow, that's a convenient thing to believe in. It was just mind control, guys. No, no lessons to learn from World War II. He, he just, he used mind control. The date of Hitler's death 
has a sinister occult significance. It's believed by some people that he chose April 30th deliberately because it coincided with Valpurgis night, which is believed to be the most important date in Satanism. What? According to one commentator, he was giving himself up to the powers of darkness. What? With Hitler gone, it was as if a spell had been broken. What? At the end of this documentary, they show a bunch of clips of victims of the Holocaust, starved and dying, left behind like they were subhumans worthy of torture and death, and they immediately cut to scenes of the Nazis in their rallies alongside the film's final conclusion, which is apparently... Many people believe occult rituals and symbols have an inherent power. To others, the power of the occult lies solely in its hold over those who believe in it. This might seem a little overly general, but the way I judge if a documentary about Nazi Germany is good or terrible is by asking one simple question. What lesson does this have to teach? And specifically, the History Channel occult films are egregious because they don't have a lesson or a point or anything to say at all. If you leave these thinking that paganism or Satanism or astrology were what motivated the evils under the Nazi regime, then what do you think the human race has to learn from this? That the occult caused all this and thus we should avoid whatever the occult is deemed to be? Is the conclusion thus that because we are not the occult, we have nothing to learn? Another good way to tell if a Nazi documentary is potentially bad is if the mention of the Holocaust seems like an afterthought. In the case of this documentary, it's briefly brought up in the final two minutes as if they forgot to mention it and just threw it in at the end. Clearly, to the perspective of the filmmakers, the narrative of conquest and glory was much more salient. If you spend the runtime of your documentary so obsessed with talking about tanks and super weapons and the names of all of Hitler's dogs that you forget to stop and go, by the way, the Nazis were bad, then congratulations, you have contributed absolutely nothing to any worthwhile discussion ever in the history of man. It's actually hard to find a History Channel show, episode, or documentary about this topic that isn't inherently disrespectful in how it chooses to present the subject. But on that note, there is nothing on the channel more inexplicable, more obnoxious, or more, well, History Channel than the 2015 reality show Hunting Hitler. Now, full disclosure, I've only watched the first two seasons of this, so no spoilers on if they catch him in the third one. I want to be surprised. Hunting Hitler exists in the unique subcategory of cable content, which I like to call shows where nothing happens. The most obvious example is Bigfoot Hunter shows, where experts wander around random forests in different parts of the country with the unironic belief that they're always one commercial break away from making the greatest scientific discovery of the millennium. Now I am going to end up analyzing Bigfoot content in another video, but only if you hit subscribe right now! The other infamous example is The Curse of Oak Island, where a group of treasure hunters have spent seven seasons seasons and 112 episodes exploring every corner of this island with not a single discovery ever being made. What's almost justifiable about these shows is that they are travel content by nature. You can easily mute your TV and pretend that you're supposed to appreciate the gorgeous views in all of these different places and not the crack team being steps away from finding their elusive treasure. Be that real treasure, evidence of Bigfoot, or Adolf Hitler being alive. Why would you want that? Content warning. We're going to talk about suicide here. Counter content warning. It's about Hitler's suicide. So who gives a shit? So here's a sentence I never thought I would say on this channel. Let's talk about the primary evidence that Adolf Hitler is dead. First, we have the eyewitness testimony. Throughout the three seasons of Hunting Hitler, the hosts make a huge deal out of the fact that no one was in the room when Hitler and his wife killed themselves. No one saw them pull the trigger. But what we do have is a concise timeline from those who were present. 
Hitler and his wife go into a room, gunshots are heard, two bodies leave that room. No one who sees the body survives the war, but to believe that there was a moment in here where there could have been a switch with lookalikes is kind of ridiculous. Not to mention that there's no justifiable reason that Hitler would gaslight his own secretaries into believing a false narrative, since he seemed to think that the invasion of Germany meant death for all of them. The first military to get to Berlin was, of course, the Soviet Union. They were the ones who found Hitler's body and looked into his death. This is one of the main reasons that there is so much confusion in the West about what happened to Hitler. Because America and the Soviet Union were very distrustful of each other. The USSR didn't immediately report that they had found Hitler's body, and neither the American population nor government trusted the claim when it eventually came out. Red Scare propaganda, claiming that the USSR was evil, inept, or both, was probably the key motivating factor in the American belief that Hitler was still alive. If the US Army had found his body instead, such doubts probably would have been seen as unpatriotic. So let's talk about forensics. We've got pictures of bones incoming, just in case that's something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Again though, it's Hitler's bones, so who cares? We currently have two pieces of forensic evidence involved in this case, a piece of a skull and fragments of a jawbone. For over six decades, it was generally believed that both of these belonged to Adolf Hitler. However, in 2009, DNA tests were done on the skull and proved that they actually belonged to a woman in her 30s, implying that this was actually the skull of Eva Braun, who fits that profile. The show milks the hell out of this. The doubt and confusion over this fragment of bone is the key construct for the narrative presented. To the showrunners, the fragment of skull not belonging to Adolf Hitler proves that there is some conspiracy. However, the jaw fragments have always been the more important forensic evidence. These have been matched to dental records, proving that they belong to Hitler. Modern testing has backed this up since then. Once you accept this crucial piece of evidence, you have to believe one of three things. Theory number one, Hitler is dead. He shot himself in the head. The place where he died is a parking lot now. Theory number two, Hitler survived the bunker, he cut out parts of his jaw like he was a cartoon supervillain, and then he went into hiding without a jaw. Theory number three, they saved Hitler's brain. Obviously, theory number one is the only one that you can explain without believing that Russia was knowingly implicit in faking Hitler's death. They would have had to plant the fake evidence, they would have needed to help him escape, and Hitler and Stalin weren't exactly on great terms at this point in history. But Hunting Hitler posits a fourth theory, that the jaw fragments don't exist. I'm looking at this from an intelligence perspective. There is no evidence that Hitler died in the bunker. But what we do have is more evidence that Hitler could have gotten away than there is for his death. This isn't an exaggeration, they bring up the skull fragment as often as they can, it's the core to their thesis, and they never mention the teeth. And the reason is that the people on this show are obsessed with Hitler being alive, and they really refuse to even entertain the idea that he's not. So clear forensic DNA evidence has to be ignored entirely. There's a reason everyone universally agrees that this show is a joke, and that's because it is, plain and simple. I really want to know the process they went through when developing the opening sequence. I hope everyone in the show pitched ideas. Okay, hear me out. We suddenly see a spinning swastika, and then we're all inside the swastika. Very tasteful, guys. Very tasteful. So because the United States didn't trust the Soviet Union, the FBI actually did start an investigation into the possibility that Hitler was alive. These files were released in 2014 and are the entire basis for leads on the show. Throughout the program, all the hosts constantly bragged that there are over 700 pages of documents in these files which the FBI managed to gather in the decades after the war. Which, uh... 
Can we talk about how not a lot of pages, 700 pages, actually is? Considering that the FBI collects and documents any and all leads that they come across, you'd think they would have gotten more than that if it was actually serious. After 9-11, they reportedly had 2.5 million pages of documents about that event. Do not act like 700 pages is impressive. What's worse is sometimes they show the documents and it's like, Dear Sir, indent indent, I would like to report a sighting starts new paragraph size 15 font. There's no consistency in these 700 pages. It's all just local rumors and crank callers like most cases like this. Hitler is spotted all over the world in the days and years after his death, just like Amelia Earhart, just like every famous missing child in the last 150 years, you can't take things like this at face value. The best part is that these guys haven't even read the documents. Instead, they design search engines, and that's how they go through the evidence. Hitler plane worldwide, Berlin. Date, 1945. Throw these words in there. Escape, plans, fly, plane. You guys couldn't just read all the documents? It doesn't seem that hard. There's only 700 pages. So the basis of the show is all these guys go to specific places mentioned in these tips and try and prove that it's plausible that Hitler hid there. Not that it's 100% true, or even that there's evidence of it, but that they can't dispute it. The reason they approach the cases this way isn't just that they're working on a show called Hunting Hitler and need to justify the premise, but also because most of these guys have spent decades obsessed over this conspiracy theory. While they keep claiming that they're making an objective analysis with no bias, a couple times an episode they'll let it slip that proving the conspiracy correct is their one and only objective. We have to, first of all, demonstrate just how bad the evidence is. But I'm trying to prove that Adolf Hitler was here. We're out here to find truth. And the more you watch it, the more clear it becomes that these guys are into Nazi culture in a way that's just really, really weird. Uh, there we go. That's swastika. There you are, a Nazi coin. Oh my god. <laughs> See a Nazi coin. Takes your breath away. Uh. So their main course of investigation is to invent a theory and then look for fringe evidence that some piece of the theory might be potentially realistic. So when they visit a community, their first step is to say, well, Hitler would need a house to live in, he'd need locals to support him, he'd need an underground tunnel. And proving any of those things plausible is their core motivation. These guys really do become Olympic gold medalists in mental gymnastics. There were Germans in this area, ergo Nazis could have lived here. There's a nice house that we got caught trying to break into, ergo Nazis could have rented it. There's a cramped, shitty vent here, ergo Hitler moved to Spain and lived in this church. While the claims made in this show are extraordinary, the evidence never is. And that's an important detail. In one of the earliest arcs in season one, these two dudes are trying to prove that there is a secret tunnel from the German underground bunker to an airport, meaning that Hitler could have walked about four hours from his bunker to a plane. How do they prove this? They start scanning walls in the airport, looking for places which appear to be hollow. Eventually, they just start knocking on the tiles, and when they find a place that makes a sound they like, they conclude that's where the tunnel was. There's a deviation from the normal pattern, so there's definitely something there. That's what I want to hear, George. That's what I want to hear. To find there was a direct connection between Temple of Airport to the Führer Bunker. This is so monumental, so huge. We just now put the last piece of the puzzle together. We connected Tempelhof Airport to the Führer Bunker. That's all they walk away from this with. This wall makes a funny noise. So this is a secret tunnel leading to the Hitler bunker that every government in the world has covered up for 75 years. That's their core discovery for the entire episode. The 
pilot episode is probably the most egregious example of how they interact with these communities, because they go in, guns blazing, looking for anyone who is alive at the time, with the sole intent of using them to build the narrative that a local community helped hide Hitler. The team concentrate on tracking down individuals that could have provided a support network for Hitler in this area. We're trying to find information out about German people. A brief off-topic thought. Do you guys remember in the first episode of this miniseries where I talked about the time that an ancient aliens guest speaker pocketed a piece of an ancient site and then took it home and started cutting it up with power tools? Remember how we all agreed that that wasn't okay? Theoretically, what if someone did this not to an ancient sacred site, but a living, breathing human being? It seems to me that the filmmakers get away with making this series by blatantly lying about its content to everyone they meet. It's rarely clear if any of the guests understand that the show is about Hitler being alive. At one point, they lie their way onto private property by claiming that they're tourists until the landowner figures out what's going on and angrily kicks them all out. So when they first show up in town, the locals innocently point them to the home of a very elderly man, and this poor man seems to believe that he is helping inform people about this horrible point in history. As he starts talking about how the Nazis tried to indoctrinate children into their propaganda programs. But the people in the dock are here to accuse him of helping hide Hitler. So things don't go great. Drill, military drill. Did they fly the swastika flag at the school? Yes. They did fly it. I have one more question. I want to push a little bit here. Was he part of the Hitler Youth? Era parte de la juventud de Hitler? Yes, there were Nazi activities at the school. Is there ability in the area to build a significant underground facility? We're about to find out. In the first History Channel video I did, I believe I coined the term Backyardigans Archaeologist. And that's really a perfect way to describe who these assholes are. They run around in their own little world and they think it's all real, but in reality, they're just pissing everyone off. The hosts continue to randomly approach locals, and they're often met with strange looks and puzzled reactions. Whenever they get an answer they don't like, or a local refuses to give up personal information, Nathan For You's weird uncle here will give some sort of talking head about how people are afraid to tell the truth. Even today. In this area, there was no big number of Germans. No. No, he says he, he doesn't know anything about that. 70 years after the end of the war, and these people today are terrified to tell us anything. Absolutely a wall of silence. Quick aside, I did some background research into Flannel Guy here, and he is shady. I'm talking arrested numerous times by the FBI shady, being hired by a sex cult to intimidate witnesses shady, impersonating an FBI agent while intimidating witnesses shady, being prosecuted at 17 for moving explosives for a terrorist organization shady. How the fuck did this guy get through the background check stage of getting hired by History Channel? This guy's in the first three or four episodes, and then he suddenly disappears from the show, and it's a mystery why, because he seems like such a fun guy to work with. Come on, get your ass in the vehicle. Sorry? Get in. I need to generate the impression that I'm a serious guy. I've done this a thousand times in a thousand places. Okay. Then of course we've got this dude who's got the body of Tarzan and the personality of Ben Shapiro. The military items were the least frequent. That made a lot of sense to me. These are not guys that are gonna be losing bullets, dropping magazines, losing guns. These are trained soldiers. They're not gonna leave a trace of what they're doing or how they do it. I would almost wanna segregate. One of the most confounding things about hunting Hitler is while they aim only to confirm the possibility of these rumors being realistic, they also seem to believe that none of these leads are contradictory. In other words, if the show looks into 20 towns where Hitler could have hid, he hid in all of those towns, and simply constantly stayed on the move. 
It may have been entirely possible that Hitler was in Shirata and then got up and moved several months later. Hitler, if he in fact got to Bari Lochi, was gonna say, all right, it, it's time to move out, to move somewhere else. He's a fugitive. You cannot set up in one place indefinitely because eventually news will get out of your presence. This broadens the conspiracy and makes it even more difficult to believe. How many secret Nazis must have been involved in this international conspiracy and how could a federal agency only come up with 700 pages of incoherent ramblings in their massive investigations into this? My favorite theory is that after the war, Francisco Franco let Hitler move into his mansion, but then was like, hey man, if, if you're gonna live here, you gotta work. And then Hitler became Franco's gardener? Franco's driver allegedly said a German gardener appeared called Adi Lupus. Adi is the name that Ava Brown used for Adolf, and Hitler loved being called Mr. Wolf, and Lupus is Latin for wolf. So, Adi Lupus. I love the implication that a fascist dictator on the run would hide Easter eggs in his new name about his true identity. Hello, yes, I am your new gardener. My name is... I am... T... Führer? So sure, the show isn't totally concrete on which of these stories are true and false, but the one thing they are totally 100% on is who Hitler wasn't. I mean, Adolf Hitler is not John Wayne. Hitler was not the Unabomber. Rule of three dictates I should have a third of those, but uh, I only found two so far and I really don't want to watch any more of the show. Anyways, the punchline is supposed to be that I'm now fully convinced that Hitler actually did become John Wayne and then the Unabomber because I trust these guest speakers that little. And on May 2nd, Admiral Donuts. One thing about History Channel shows that we haven't really touched on yet is how difficult it can be to tell which parts are authentically the characters speaking and which are manufactured in the editing process. Throughout Haunting Hitler, we keep cutting between people on the ground investigating in real time and these two dudes supposedly doing laptop work in LA. But the way that it's edited and the way that they talk makes it glaringly clear that this is a scripted sequence created near the end of production to stitch all of this together. So they're gonna have to get to uh, another German community, another Nazi-supported yeah, community. Yeah, I mean, but where? But where, where would you go? Was it possible Hitler could have gone there? This is the place where we should be sending the team. Gotta do it now. Let's, let's do it. The entire timeline of events we come to understand in the episodes probably aren't real, and a lot of what they say, they've been told to say. We've got some meat here. However, the longer the show goes on, the more these two actively seem to take a real role in the narrative. For instance, this guy at one point goes on a rant about how he thinks Hitler hid in South America and then started planning, quote, the Fourth Reich, and that he was probably planning to bomb America. Then he says, that might sound crazy, but they said the same thing about 9-11. This may seem something out of this world crazy, but if you and I had been talking a couple years before 9-11 that this was possible to hijack American airplanes and knock down the World Trade Center, you immediately dismiss it. It was the United States which brought down the Third Reich. And only once the United States was brought down, could the Fourth Reich come? I am scratching my head trying to think of real evidence the show comes up with. A lot of the stuff they discover you can figure out yourself by reading one paragraph of a Wikipedia article, and if they don't know those things going in, they probably shouldn't be investigating the Nazis. Very loose gravel. Definitely a hole here. Look at this. The puzzle was starting to come together. When I described this as a show where nothing happens, I meant that wholeheartedly. But worse, it's a show that will stretch a single instance of nothing happening over four episodes and three cliffhangers. In the final episode, they're convinced that they're about to find Hitler's plane submerged in this swamp. But then it turns out that it's just some old parts of a forgotten dock. And you can tell how defeated and angry everyone is. And the host goes on this long rant about how Hitler didn't die and how he's going to keep fighting. When I began this investigation, I was completely skeptical. I assumed, without any doubt, that he died in the bunker. Frankly, I don't think a guy like Adolf Hitler gives up that easily. If he's got a way out, wouldn't he take it? 
he did find a way out, and he did take it. There's this really ugly running thread throughout this whole show, where these investigators seem to have some sort of unspoken respect for Hitler. Which is a weird way to put it, but it's what you end up seeing. Not only was Adolf Hitler tactically sound, he was a forward thinker. The presidential suite is really the only room suitable to put a guy with the clout like Hitler. And Adolf Hitler had a pretty good idea of what he was doing. He didn't wake up Monday morning and say, hey, I think I'm going to try to escape. Moments like this almost make hunting Hitler feel like a reverse Ancient Aliens. Ancient Aliens is a show about looking at all these ancient cultures and all the things they accomplished, all the great things they did, and saying, hey, these guys were too uncivilized and brutish to have accomplished any of this. And Hunting Hitler is all about looking at the supposed white master race and all of their leaders and saying, hey, these guys were all smart, they were all brilliant, how could they have failed like this? Adolf Hitler was too tactically brilliant and forward-thinking to shoot himself in the head without a backup plan. That's really what it boils down to for these people. And that final rant that this investigator goes on at the end of the first season, about how he's a free thinker who knows the truth about Hitler, it ends on the perfect sentence that accidentally encapsulates this entire project. I never take facts at face value, and I never will. Yep, that's Haunting Hitler, everyone. I truly could not say it better myself. So, let's wrap this up by discussing what is, without a doubt, the strongest piece of evidence this show ever came up with. At the start of Season 2, the investigators on the show find a man who claims that his father helped Nazis escape to Argentina during the Second World War. And after pushing him to show any evidence of this, the man runs to the other room and brings back a photo of an elderly man. The man explains that this is a photo of Adolf Hitler long after the war. My heart's racing a little bit. Since the smoking gun, I've been spent the last 12 years of my life looking for. We immediately cut to the investigative headquarters of the show, where intense 3D analysis is used to prove that the photo, without a doubt, really is that of an elderly Adolf Hitler. We start looking for things that line up. I got an earlobe. Look at the shape of the ear. This shape of the ear here, very similar. Look at how that mouth they fall right on top. So all of these things are lining up. Look at how excited some of these guys get over this. You can really tell this is the greatest moment of their lives. Isn't it sad? It overlays very well. Adolf Hitler, he's alive well after 1945. I would be pursuing the case. This was around the time that History aired a documentary about the disappearance of Amelia Earhart, which claimed to have smoking gun evidence that she ended up around Japan, using facial analysis to prove that a photo seemed to feature her in the Marshall Islands. However, as we'll see in a moment, History Channel investigators seem to be incapable of using the reverse image search option on Google which quickly proved that the image was actually from 1935, two years before she disappeared. After this was proven, History Channel quietly pulled all airings of the piece. So you might be shocked to discover that this case of facial analysis is also bunk, and that this isn't really Adolf Hitler. But if that's the case, then who is this a photograph of? Mo Howard. It's Mo Howard of the Three Stooges. Are you fucking kidding me? How the fuck do you make a mistake that massive? Who the fuck was in charge of analyzing this goddamn photograph that they couldn't figure out that it was one of the fucking Three Stooges? How fucking stupid does every goddamn person on this stupid fucking channel have to be that you can't fucking tell the difference between Adolf Hitler and fucking Mo Howard? Recently discovered footage from within German headquarters during the final days of the war appears to show Adolf Hitler squabbling with several unidentified high-ranking members of the Nazi military. 
Is it possible that these very soldiers were those who helped sneak Hitler out of the country in the final days of the war? And if they escaped successfully, could this trio still be alive today? So, to recap everything we've learned in the past few weeks, this is an alien, this is Atlantis, and this is Adolf fucking Hitler. Usually, at this point in the video, I plug a sponsor, but I don't have a sponsor for this video, so, uh... Here's my Instacart referral code. Actually, out of my next four videos, only one of them is going to have a sponsor, and that's not a great idea fiscally if you're a YouTuber. So if you want to help me get to a point as a creator where it's more rational for me to do this from time to time, I suggest supporting me on Patreon. I've just uploaded a Patreon exclusive video for May, and we're gonna try and do one of those every single month, and I'm trying to get to 666 patrons by October, and we're gonna do a fun little spooky video if I can pull that off. It's just a great way to guarantee I can keep making content, and I'm trying really hard to make it worthwhile for you guys as well. I've also decided I'm probably gonna do a little bonus video in June called History Channel Oddities, and I thought it would just be weird stuff the History Channel did that really didn't fit into any of these videos. Sort of like a disjointed skitty review like I used to do. Uh, so if you guys have any recommendations for just weird History Channel things that you want to see me talk about, leave those in the comments section below, and uh, probably send them to me on Twitter so I'll definitely see them. But the thing I want you to walk away from this video with is that we are ramping up to the gigantic Garfield premiere, which hopefully will be going up on June the 5th, 2020. I've been working on this one for six months. It's one of the biggest videos I've ever done. I've put so much effort into it, and so I just want you guys all to see it. So if you don't want to miss that, and you don't want to miss the final bonus History Channel episode, go down to that, that box down there, I guess, <laughs> and hit the subscribe button, set the notifications to all notifications. We've gained a lot of subscribers in the past month, more than I gained in all of 2019, and I'm so proud, and I just really want to keep that train rolling, you know? Okay, for the end slate today, we've got a few options. First of all, if you want to see every video I've done on topics like this, you can check out the Conspiracy playlist, and if you just want to restart the entire History Channel saga, you can check out the History Channel slash Documentary playlist down below. That's going to restart the whole adventure over for you. You can watch this all in one go, or you could watch the video that YouTube has recommended for you. But most importantly, don't forget to click on that little icon on my face and hit subscribe. It means the world to me. With that, I've been Quinn Kyle Hoover, this has been my Quinn Quarantine, and that's all you need. From the moment Cartoon Network launched on October 1st, 1992, it had one simple goal in mind. To serve as the safe haven for cartoons of future and past, and to become the bedrock for the innovation of animation. And ignoring a few untimely cancellations, I think this is exactly what it still has managed to be. Through good and bad, Cartoon Network continues to be the bastion of its namesake. But it's interesting to remember that not that long ago, there was an attempt to creatively gentrify the network's content. I'm talking, of course, about the swift invasion in the early 2010s of live-action Cartoon Network programming. A sentence which literally does not make sense. It's hard to outstay your welcome when you really were never that welcome at all, and CN Real is perhaps the greatest evidence of that. Today I want to jump back to study this bizarre little trend, why it happened in the first place, and why it ultimately failed. Up to this point, we've dived into five shows which were featured on CN Real at its first transmission, but there's still one left which I saved for the end entirely on purpose. That being The Other Siders, the Cartoon Network live action Ghost Show. Out of all the shows that aired on CN Real in 2009, this is the one I remember talking about the most with my friends. And not unironically, we all thought it was really bad, 
but we loved it so much. Around this time, I remember I had gotten really into ghost shows. I think Ghost Hunters was off the air by then, but Ghost Adventures was just starting off, and we took that show really seriously. When I watched Ghost Adventures, I truly believed that it was something scientific, as if these guys were constantly moments away from finding irrefutable evidence that ghosts are real. And we used to stay up late to watch these live marathons they did, because it felt like at any instant the world would be changed by these investigators. Then the other ciders aired, and I went, okay, this is bullshit. And here's why. I could believe that experienced professionals could prove that ghosts are real. I could even believe that hyper-obsessed adults could do it. But the idea that ghosts were going to be proven to be real by the fucking kids from my math class, no. I did not buy that. My name is Zach, I'm 13 years old, and I'm the tech manager on the team. I like being the tech manager because I'm a techie and I like playing around with all the new gear we get. Some people in Southern California like to go surfing. We do something different. I get to handle all this really cool equipment like walkies, which are pretty much my favorite because you feel like you're in an army base or like in a war or something like that. If it wasn't for school, I'd be a full-time ghost hunter. The Other Siders is probably the worst ghost show I've ever seen, solely on the virtue of it being really dull. When you really start to break it apart, the core thing that makes the difference is just the presentation. In most good, watchable ghost shows, evidence is dispersed throughout the program to make it more suspenseful and fun. EVPs will be played back as they happen, and if anything nuts goes on, it will be repeated a bunch of times in a row. In The Other Siders, all of the evidence is saved until the last five minutes, where it's all presented and discussed by the cast. This means that most of the show is the characters collecting said evidence, going from room to room not knowing if they found anything, until they leave eventually. So most of every episode just boils down to nearly blind wandering around poorly lit identical rooms until the episode is basically over. But I'll admit that I found this to be one of the most entertaining shows to revisit, because as I've said in the past, I love shows where nothing happens. And The Other Siders isn't just a show where nothing happens, it's a show where nothing happens, where the cast remains confidently cocky that a lot has in fact just happened. If you're here, can you give us a sign? Oh, oh yeah. I feel kind of bad for the kids in this show, because it seems like most of them have that attachment to this, which I remember having at that age. You know, just that special feeling about accomplishing something that makes you really bummed out if someone takes it away from you, so you just become defiant even if your words stop making sense. So when it comes down to discussing if they've single-handedly proved that ghosts exist, the debates about it get rather moody and uh, personal when they shouldn't, because the evidence they come up with is terrible. Almost every EVP they come up with is not actually even an EVP, it's just a recording of empty static which they really want to be an EVP. I think I know what it says. What? what? It's cold. Do you hate it here? It sounds nothing like it's cold. It's just a noise. It clearly is a noise. We're just like listening, trying to make words out of it. And every once in a while, there is a good EVP, but it always feels like one of the adults like dubbed something in to make them all feel better. If there's someone here with us, please show us a sign or do something previous that you've done before. And whenever their evidence is lacking, they circle back around to this defense that their ghosts just suck. Like, they got good evidence, but the ghosts are just bad at being ghosts. There's definitely something trying to communicate. Even if we can't hear it, it's still trying to communicate, so. Looks like it has wings, kind of. Yeah. This could be a spirit, maybe a tortured soul, trying to communicate with us. And that seems like a more reasonable explanation than a bug or a piece of the ceiling or something like that. The best scene in any episode is probably the one where they're filming at the Lincoln Heights jail and they capture something that they think is an apparition and it's clearly just a guy. Oh That's my so god. Funny. We saw that. But they're all confident that it's a ghost and that they've just proven that ghosts exist. And it looks too fast to be an actual person. It looks well, it's like it's definitely not an actual person. Yeah. It's just like an outline of light. I don't know, I'm kind of iffy, but I want to lean towards haunted. 
because it definitely wasn't one of us running by one of those cameras. Motherfuckers, it's just a guy! <laughs> It's notable to point out that while most ghost shows film from, say, 8pm to 8am, this show features kids being chaperoned around by adults, who I presume the cameramen are, and based on the episodes it seems they're usually out of there by, like, midnight. So one of the reasons that their evidence is so terrible is that it's pretty clear that they have around 4 hours of footage to work with instead of the usual 12. But I will admit, Every few episodes, they do come up with something that is pretty impressive. Impressive enough to be on a real ghost show, I mean. But when I was a kid, that didn't make me think more of the show. In fact, it kind of had the exact opposite effect. Like, if this bunch of kids, who clearly don't know what they're doing, can find evidence purely by luck, then it feels totally unspectacular that some muscular adult grifter can do the exact same thing. In other words, The Other Siders wasn't just a bad show for me. It was a show that was so bad that it dragged every other show in its genre down with it. And it's funny how time works, because rewatching this today, in 2020, all I could find myself thinking is, God, I wish I was watching cartoons right now. In 2009, History Channel made the bold choice to air a reality show filmed in Nevada entirely about a pawn store and the lives of its employees. While seeming like a leap of faith at the time, in just a few short years, pawn stars would become an international phenomenon. So widely known that I'm guessing many of you weren't even aware that it was something made by the History Network. The show focuses mainly on the three generations of the Harrison family. The old man, his son Rick, and Rick's son, Corey. Alongside those three, Corey's lifelong best friend Chum Lee will also hang around personified in wildly different ways depending on what episode you're watching. Throughout the show, each employee will meet with various people visiting the shop, who typically either want to sell various items or pawn them. They haggle, they argue, experts are brought in, people give in or walk away, that's the show. Pawn Stars might seem like something that could easily be wiped away or forgotten about mere seconds after the credits roll. But the show was such a massive phenomenon that it really changed that subgenre of TV. And I think it's absolutely worth revisiting, even if it's just for a short little video like this. So when I started writing this video, I realized that I hadn't watched much of Pawn Stars since I was a little kid. And since my memory of that time is pretty hazy on account of the booze, I decided to rewatch it from the start. And what I found was very surprising. You see, usually when people start talking about this show, the first thing they have to say is how much it's changed. When it first started, it was authentic and real, and now it's just nothing but a representation of the phony nature of manufactured reality crap. And there is some validity to that hot take, but it's clear that from Season 1, Episode 1, the show is oversaturated with moments which are clearly put in just for the sake of the camera being there. Fine, I will go to the eye doctor if you two turkeys get off of my back. I think what's really happened with Pawn Stars is that a majority of its fans started watching when they were kids, and couldn't tell that it's fake. And when they became adults, and could tell, they thought that the show had changed. Not to say that there hasn't been a shift in the format, but we'll get back to that later. If I could compare Pawn Stars Season 1 to any show, oddly enough, I think I would go with... The Office. Which, I know, there are 700 video essays about The Office and 10 rewatch podcasts, I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about it. But in my mind, Pawn Stars was an attempt to create a show much like The Office, except on a quarter of the budget. The goofy cast, the hilarious weekly mishaps, the mockery of hierarchical capitalist systems which create a toxic workplace, yet seem to always come back around to creating a profitable business model, it's all there. The main difference between the two is that The Office is a scripted sitcom that tries to emulate a documentary reality show, and Pawn Stars is a documentary reality show that tries to emulate a scripted sitcom. The A-plot of a lot of these early episodes, featuring visitors buying and selling items, are legitimate to some extent. But essentially, all of what I would call the B-plot of these episodes is entirely fake. 
And what gives this away is primarily how none or few of them have a long-term effect on the show. They are erased from the collective memory of the characters, and entirely to reset the status quo by the time of the next couch gag. For instance, in Season 1, Episode 6, Rix hires his 17-year-old niece as a favor to her mother. Corey is then told that if he can train his cousin to work in the shop, he'll be given a raise. We're then shown a series of scenes revolving around that story ultimately ending with her successfully passing the test. Cora gets his ready, she proves she can do the job, the credits roll, she is never seen again. In another story a few seasons later, Rick becomes convinced that the cavalier nature of how his employees speak to one another is affecting business, and calls in a sensitivity trainer to try and build a healthy atmosphere. What follows feels like a series of skits from It's Always Sunny, as the trainer is stunned by how far gone the characters are from having a healthy work environment. You got a lot of peacock in you. Yeah. A ton of peacock. You can have a lot of peacock in you, bro. <laughs> So usually you're shown a hackneyed bit that pulls the curtain back by seeming too irreverent and non-concrete, but other times there will be a segment that makes you hope to god that the show is staged. Like in Season 1, Episode 9, they set up that one of the female employees has been habitually late to work. So the old man says, As punishment for your tardiness, we're gonna let the fat one sexually harass you for our personal amusement. Everybody knows Chum loves peaches, and we're talking about the girl, not the fruit. In season one, there's also, no joke, a clip show episode. The characters sit around remembering purchases that they made earlier in the season entirely to make an extra episode without really producing more content. Literally, I cannot imagine this show being more of an overt sitcom without executive producer Greg Daniels popping up at the end of every episode. But one thing I can certainly admit is that what I call the A-plot in certain episodes seems pretty legitimate by comparison. At least in the early seasons, which we're primarily talking about right now. The frustration and anger of many of these visitors, previously convinced that they had something valuable, proves to be far too real in comparison to the wooden performances of the B-plot. For instance, this man, who has purchased what he thought was an $800 historical gun, only to figure out that it's a cheap replica worth $75. Yeah, so, okay, maybe the thing is a, is a fake. I... My wife was pissed uh, when I bought this gun, now she's really gonna kill me. Which, by the way, anytime some goofball war collector comes in, he will go out of his way to mention at some point that he hates his wife. I either gotta get rid of the gun or the wife, and... Oh man, some people would choose to get rid of the wife. I've had her a long time. She's paid <laughs> off. Um, do you use this for protection? Uh, yes. Uh, my wife has a problem sometimes with me, and uh, <laughs> one never knows. Okay. It, it just happens pretty much every time. One thing I really start to notice is that as the show goes on, the commentary on the pawn shop and the tone of the people visiting starts to swiftly change. Pawn Stars first began filming after the Great Recession of 2007 and 2008. And because of that, many of the guests visiting would be very open that they were selling these things because their lives were falling apart and they just needed any cash to make it through the month. This is especially true in cases of people pawning their items. Now for those of you unfamiliar with the practice, pawning is when one of these shops essentially loans you money and in exchange you give them an equally valuable item. If you can pay back the loan, you get the item back, but if not, they get to keep it and resell it. Pawning is important because without that business strategy, a shop like this is just a really douchey expensive goodwill. It's kind of a scummy business practice, pretty much like most loans, and is built to take advantage of people who don't really have a lot of options. And it's super strange how these early episodes juxtapise these fat idiots doing stupid shit alongside horribly sad stories about why their customers are taking out loans that they probably won't be able to pay back and how much of their lives have been totally torn apart by the recession. Would you take 1500 
You try to take the food out of my wife's mouth, you know, but... Yeah, and put it in mine. I, I, uh... This is starkly different from how Pawn Stars presents those same things only a few seasons later. First of all, the act of pawning on screen stops happening pretty quickly. Probably because it was always super depressing whenever it would happen. And second, the show pretty quickly just starts being about finding cool stuff and showing it on camera, with an active attempt to not let the audience think of the sad stories there might otherwise be behind all of these people coming in. Famously, one episode of the show features Pat the NES Punk bringing in several ultra-rare cartridges and attempting to sell them for upwards of 30 grand. Another episode is just about Star Wars collectibles, with several extraordinarily valuable items being presented. From original props to a functioning Boba Fett rocket launcher prototype. And with Rick just randomly choosing not to fight for these items despite his clear ability to sell them for a very good price. And I think in episodes like these, it's obvious that the guest has no intention of selling these things. Their sole and only motivation is wanting to be on TV. And even if they want to sell these things, it actually doesn't make sense for them to do it on the show. Rick will usually ask for less than half of what he can sell an item for to make a profit, will be very open about the fact that he has to rip people off to make his business model work, and at the same time, being on the show is essentially free advertising for the product you're trying to sell. The smartest thing to do, really, is to go on the show, have the value of the item confirmed, wait for the episode to air, and then just sell it on eBay or to a private collector, because selling it to the store means almost certainly getting screwed over. It is somewhat satisfying, on the other hand, in the few instances where the characters on the show have been defrauded themselves, spending a ridiculous amount of money on items which turn out to be totally fake. I know the losses are so small that it doesn't touch their bottom line, but I still find something so oddly cathartic about it. Of course, in a way, I feel that way because the show is designed to make me feel that way. Its frustrating elements alongside the morons presented in the show are some of the things that make it so unbelievably bingeable. But I would posit the most notable thing about Pawn Stars is actually the massive effect that it had on the market. While Rick Harrison openly fought to make the show because he knew television was the greatest form of advertising, I'm not sure anyone expected it to become the household smash hit that it ended up being, in some ways transforming the pawn shop into a must-see for any Las Vegas tourist. This meant almost immediately that the people in the show could no longer actually work at the shop, because it would become flocked with hyperfans trying to get photos with these pseudo-celebrities. To film the show today, parts of the store are roped off and reserved, extras are selected to hang around in the backgrounds of scenes, and visitors are then vetted ahead of time to interact with the cast. This is one of the reasons that guests have become less authentic over time, literally including episodes where people like Steve Carell have guest starred. It's also why the experts brought in seem to immediately have an insane amount of research done when the narrative presents the gap between them being told about the item and arriving as just a few minutes. Also, all the characters were on iCarly once. I thought about talking about this in more detail, but anyone who's been watching for a couple years knows that I'm incapable of talking about iCarly without making half the video about it. I should probably just do a standalone iCarly video and never talk about it again. The overwhelming crossover success of the Pawn Stars has led to many stations producing content which is pretty damn similar in retrospect. You look at something like Brothers in Arms, and it's pretty clear that without Pawn Stars, this format just wouldn't be so perfected. Meanwhile, other channels have attempted to make their own Pawn Store shows, and History Channel has attempted to make numerous spin-offs that no one wants or asked for. Like Cajun Pawn Stars, Pawn Stars UK, Pawn Stars Australia, and Pawnography, a weird obscure attempt to make a game show starring the cast. I'm gonna go with uh, Mr. Potato Head. They I, actually I, used a potato to begin with. A real potato? You actually had to supply the potato? Yes. I believe it. <laughs> believe it yeah. Wow. 
And we and when kids bitch today about like the, the, the PlayStation. Was this made by Channel Awesome? So as you can guess, these four dudes moving from being pawn employees to legitimate paid actors and celebrities has significantly changed their lives. But no one more so than the one, the only, Chum Lee. I expect no one working on the show expected their goofy side character to become the most beloved and worshipped part of the cast. But in a way, it makes sense, because he's typically the only one designed to actually be likable. The other guys are charming, but only Chum Lee comes across as a person you would actually want in your life, which in the manufactured world of Pawn Stars often turns him into a straight man. You cheer right in the bedroom, Chum Lee? As I've mentioned, this leads to a massive inconsistency between seasons in how they want you to see the Chummeister. In some episodes, he talks like Kevin Malone and doesn't know who Isaac Newton is. And in other episodes, he's trying to convince the shop owners that they need to buy Banksy art and is a connoisseur of modern taste. Chum is also, notably, the smartest person to capitalize on the show's popularity starting his own company to sell novelty merch surrounding his character and even a candy store across the street from the pawn shop. Because of this, it's been said that Chum Lee has become an outright multi-millionaire, outflanking the others in business smarts and competency to some extent. And as much as his stupidness is clearly a facade, so is his cutesy demeanor. In 2016, Chum Lee's house was raided because of an investigation into sexual assault allegations. During that raid, police found crystal meth, marijuana, Zantax, and multiple illegal firearms. The copious amount of drugs, alongside odd things like scales, suggested, at least to police, that he was a drug dealer on the side, and was potentially using his work and side business as a mild front. Which, uh, gotta say, pretty ballsy move to use a candy store as a drug front seems really obvious in hindsight. More notable to many, they also discovered what was apparently called the Chum Chum Room, which is where he would do coke and have strippers over to get his chum on. You got a girlfriend? Chumley ended up taking a plea bargain, meaning that his record shows a misdemeanor instead of any felony charges. This is notable because, from what I've been told, History Channel employees are forbidden from having felony charges. So if he had been found guilty, it would have potentially been the end of the show. Now that I've finished telling you about all this, I'm realizing it's maybe not super important to the discussion of the program. Uh, but I would have been doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you about the Chum Chum Room. Pawn Stars is a really weird program, especially when watching it in order. It exists exclusively to advertise an industry which I'm not overly fond of, and in a way, it's kind of gross to see this business bloom in a post-recession nation because of its purpose in prospering off of the suffering of others. But there's something undeniably intoxicating about the characters and how their stories are told, even if I know it's all fake from day one. And I can't decide if that means that I'm buying into overt propaganda, or if I'm a stuck-up asshole for even worrying about it in the first place. Uh, hey guys, we've got three very quick things to talk about. First of all, I want to give a big thanks to the guest editor for this video, Chris London, aka Adustus. Uh, he really made it so easy to get through all the videos I was trying to put out this month, and without him, I don't know when I'd be able to get around to putting this one out. Second of all, real quick, I was involved in a Garfield design, which is currently for sale. I think it's going to be for sale for another two weeks, and it's PDF only, but it supports all the artists involved. So if you guys want to see that, that's also linked in the description down below. While I was making this video, I actually started to remember a skit I was a part of in high school that was making fun of Pawn Stars, and I sort of looked through the archives, and I managed to actually find it, so I figured for the rest of the Patreon crawl, we'd watch like the first minute of that, and if you want to see the whole thing, it's going to be uploaded to my second channel, Quentin Retoos, which you can find, you guessed it, in the description down below. And we're going to start playing that in three, two... Hi, I'm Don Creasy, owner of the Pawn Hub Pawn Store, America's number one store for pawn. Now, sometimes on the slow days, 
we like to mess with the customers a little bit, you know, just drive them a little bit insane. Because with a TV show, we make enough money doing that, we, we can just mess around the whole day at work. Uh, hey, can you give me change for this 20? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's see what we got here. All right. Um, that's Andrew Jackson. It's looking good. Um, if you, I'm not sure if you actually knew this, but Andrew Jackson was the president who did the uh, Indian Removal Act. I don't care. So, you know. Okay. Uh, tell you what. The most I could give you for this bill right now would be about $5. Like four of them? No. Um, and I was like, nah, I'm only going to give you like five dollars for that. It's probably not even real. It drove him a little bit insane. I saw him, a little piece of him die on the inside. It just made my day. It was a, it was a good day at the workplace. But this one in particular, because I just don't know that much about it, I could actually, I could call my friend to come and look at it, but um, it might actually make it more than twenty dollars. Right, so. like I'm just, okay. Um. Tell you what, why don't I go call him and then we can just go sort it out that way. Hey Matthew, how's it going? Good, man. How have you been? Mm, doing good. So we got this $20 bill in the store today. The customer seems to think it's worth $20, which... Mm, yeah. The mark turned out good. It's definitely authentic. Um, I mean, it's a real $20 bill. It's about how much is it worth, do you think? I've seen them going for $17 at auctions and Des Moines, but that's probably the best we can do. I can give you $6 for this. Why don't you give me four fives like I asked for? I'll tell you what, man, you're driving a hard bargain. So I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll go seven. So yeah, I feel, I feel pretty confident about that feeling. You know, I walked in wanting something and I, I walked out with less than that, but you know, in this economy, you take what you can get, and I feel like it was a—it was an honest man, an honest business, and uh, a good deal. Good deal. So I actually gave the guy seven dollars for a twenty-dollar bill. What a dumb. How do you feel about that? Uh, I feel all right. 